Sims, hello and welcome to the UCI 2022 Gravel World Championships here from Vincenzo Invenito in Italy. My name's Matt Payne. I'm going to be bringing you all the action on this day two of some great competition. The conditions at our race start slightly cooler than yesterday, but the wind slightly stronger coming from the northeast. And Vincenzo playing host to our race start. A, a real mix of riders gathered down in Vicenza, down in Veneto, and uh, including Greg van Abermaat, a man who should need no introduction to anybody who is used to uh, road racing. And uh, we caught up with him just down before he headed into the start line uh, to uh, talk about his uh, bike and all the things. Expect, actually, so it's my first race on a gravel bike and it's directly a world championship so it's uh, a little bit unusual but uh, yeah I did the first uh, 40k yesterday and looks quite nice and uh, we'll see how far I can come it's a new thing with uh, other materials so I think leg wise should be okay but technical <laughs> technical wise maybe it could be a problem. Well, really interesting, and he's riding that BMC machine, brand new machine, ridden bike, to so victory. That's actually also why I'm here. It's a new bike of BMC, the Cassius. It's a development for uh, only for gravel, uh, competitive, competitive bike, and it's super nice to ride. Uh, and uh, yeah, the group set of the new group set of Campagnolo. So it's a uh, it's a great bike. I think this will be not a problem. <laughs> So confident in his bike, confident in his machinery, and a rider who, having won the Olympic road race, a Harry uh, Roubaix winner uh, twice, world champion, is going to have no problems, I think, with the technicality here today. Looking pretty chilled out and uh, riding his first gravel race. Remember, of course, Rebecca Rush's uh, very first gravel race that was heading out into uh, the race that the uh, was going out and uh, riding. So our course today comes out from Vicenza. It heads down into towards Padua Padova, uh, along the side of the river. After its initial hilly start, that long run into Padova and out along the riverside, characterized by narrow tracks and turns before we come to Citadella, and two full laps of the circuit. Our riders will know exactly what's coming. And our riders out on course, making the way out towards it. 194 kilometers the race here today. And as you can see across the course, those two early hills, and then it gets hillier as we come back up towards the Citadella with those two laps finishing in the center. So our riders getting ready to get warmed up. They include uh, Peter Sagan and other uh, sports stars, a regular cyclocross rider and uh, a regular rider at all sorts of different disciplines, including mountain bike. New thing for me, then uh, I don't know what to expect. But I can expect it's gonna be hard because uh, 190 kilometers on gravel, a little bit up and down, technical parts that uh, it's gonna be hard. You choose a road bike, a Roubaix bike, huh? why? Because it's faster than a gravel bike, you know, then uh, it's better. I have still a small suspension in the front, then uh, should be okay for uh, this kind of trail. I'm not sure if that look in his eyes was a uh, total confidence when he said it should be okay. I think he's going to be in for a rude awakening and a real interesting choice of bikes. We've seen brand new gravel bikes uh, like those ridden by Greg Van Abba, Pauline Ferran Prevost. We've seen road bikes as ridden by people like Peter Sagan. And on the start list, a real mix of riders as well. People like Toby Perry, who's been riding in the road in Spain. You've got Adam Levastic in here. Look out for Travis Barrett as well. We have Travis Bramley in who is looking to take this on but Alexis Roach of Ireland one of those big names along with Seth Rombats who could well figure up at the front of the racing Ryan Christensen making a return and good to see him back on uh, the uh, bike and riding in for New Zealand and uh, as you run through the list you can see the big names like Matthew Vanderpoel a rider who is uh, one of the hot favourites for the race. One uh, journalist actually saying they'd eat the hat if he didn't uh, take the uh, victory, but we will see as it comes through. You can see Matt Beers in here as well, and uh, Nick Robel in. Ivar Slick in here, the unbound winner from this year. Teammate of Matthew Vanderpoel, in fact, and a rider who could be up there, Kalajan in as well. 
Watch out for Lachlan Morton, another rider who really has uh, spent a lot of time riding on the uh, gravel. He knows exactly how to handle the bike. Peter Sagan, rider number 99. Well, I'm sure that's not going to be reflected in his uh, finishing position. Watch out for Nathan Haas. Haas, of course, a uh, veteran of lots of gravel races this year. And uh, of the riders, Greg Van Arbema and Zenedek Stieber in the mix two riders who never fail to uh, entertain the fans nicholas roshan here as well and uh, nicholas uh, doing a lot of the gravel ridings along with matt stevens good to see matt taking to the start and david revelin uh, in here good to see david coming through miguel anguel lopez another of our riders who we know maybe know more from the road and uh, greets today because it is the first uh, world championship for weekend for the gravel world championships by the president of the uci let's uh, catch up with david uh, lapartion president uh, of the uci after he's uh, greeted our riders on that start line that's wonderful. The atmosphere in between the riders is less pressure, but it's really some a new discipline connected with the reality of today, connected with the uh, desire of, uh, of people riding a bike to be also connected with the nature. So that's great. And we have really good champions. Well, you can see him here chatting to one of those champions, Matthew of Vanderpool, multiple time uh, cyclocross rider, a, a real exciting rider, somebody who loves to race. Uh, he's kind of either in it or he's not. I had the pleasure of watching him mountain bike, road race, uh, cyclocrossing when he was a youngster, a rider who uh, we know has the skills, but uh, he's going to be up against some absolute class of riders. People like Sandy Stieber, Stevie, are one of those riders known to whipping it up. I don't think there's anyone who's going to be able to do that on the course here today as Peter Sagan gets some directions out as they come out. Yeah, you go out it's straight and then goes up a big hill, turn right. It's really easy, mate. Get to the front and stay there is kind of the plan. Uh, Sagan, of course, multi-time, three-time world champion. And Greg Van Arbema, a rider, multi-winner of uh, stages of the uh, tour, as well, of course, as an Olympic uh, champion, a winner of Paris-Roubaix. David Ballerini in here. At, uh, with the Italians with some strong squads down here. A lot of riders from Italy really getting in to the uh, uh, racing into the gravel. Now, Fedorov could be an interesting rider in the mix here as he uh, pushes on. He's alongside a slightly smaller rider. You can see the uh, high difference there between Miguel Angua Lopez. No one better as a climber. Will the Colombian today be able to harness those skills early on? Will it be a case of he's going to be battling it out sir? in the finish? He's going to be in the group at the front. And then we have uh, Carlos Verona Quintanilla in the front row. That's the whole of the front row. Big pack of riders due to take the start. 140 riders in the men's elite road race. Uh, signed on to take to the start. And it is a wide start, although it does go uphill very quickly from this race start. It takes a sweeping right, a left, and then goes up in to a water Mont Perica. And that is a, one of the key moments. So you can see the start here. That long sweeping right hand turn. It's wide all the way to the top of the climb. Climb up alongside the porticos on the way up uh, to the basilica, up at the uh, top of the climb. And uh, this, the uh, really uh, start of uh, what is going to be a uh, long race for these uh, riders. It is, of course, 194 kilometers. That's 120 and a half miles, 2,625 feet, or 800 meters of climbing across the distance. So the riders held by by tape, and you can see by that mix of rims, the amount of clearance on those tyres, and the uh, size of the uh, tyres, a real variety of kit here today. A mix of single, one by and two by uh, a double chain sets on there, but without major hills to test the riders and a major altitude, it's going to be quick here today. Our riders here at the first men's elite UCI World Championship, the Grand World Championship, about to take that start. Who's going to get that fast start out and away? You can see the riders quickly clipping in. Peter Sagan takes a little bit of a look down. Maybe didn't hit that quite as smoothly as he would have hoped as the big pack 140 riders head out and away and as they go along outside the rail lines that snake compresses itself around those turns 
Is anybody going to put in an early push for glory? We have to see our little bridge over the top of the railway tunnel. That little bit of a chicane in and around. And a lot of the riders won't be used to going straight into a climb like this because this is the first kick up. You see the wall on your left hand side. So it turns in to the uh, porticos and that's in between those road bars to go. Porticos on the, our left, the riders right. That amazing corner going up. Always oh, the uh, vaulted ceilings underneath, running right from the base of the hill right to the top, and the riders spread across the road. Now, where it's lighter, that is the smaller go at the edges. There's more dirt and debris. You can see the spectators packing the edges as they come up this uh, raised uh, roadway. It maintains a steady gradient right to the top. It's absolutely uh, stunning, but at the moment, the riders are focusing on the uh, wheels of the riders uh, in front and uh, heading them up at the moment, you can see. And it is uh, going to uh, be uh, Court Nielsen uh, leading out Magnus Court Nielsen, a man known for his attacking aggressive style. He goes up from the gun, but look at the number of blue jerseys there from the Italian squad. And the Italians are really pushing the numbers up. Now, a right-hand turn coming up as those motorbikes sweep slightly to the left and then around to the right. And this really does uh, characterize the racing. We see a lot of uh, almost dead turns actually out on the course a little bit further in. So uh, that's when you're going to get compression and expansion in that bunch as they very quickly start to push up on to the uh, climb. And at the moment, uh, Marco Gazzola of Italy leading the uh, group. But look at this. You can just see in that light orange colour is Matthew van der Poel just pulling up onto the side of Court Nielsen. And he rider there just out of the saddle pulling hard on those bars. So he's not the smallest of riders, but it means he's got some upper body strength to move that bike around. A regular mountain biker, a rider who we've seen compete in everything from the Olympic mountain guys to the World Cups, the World Championship. Amazing rider all round. Question is, has he got the power to hold it today? And look at this quick attack coming. Well, it's early days. There's two major climbs on the way through. Three in total on the way out of the hills here around the slopes of Vicenza. As they come up towards the top, it's Miguel Angel Lopez who started to try and push a clear here as we go around the uh, sanctuary uh, for the Madonna de Monte Barrico. So the uh, sanctuary to the Madonna on uh, Monte Barrico. It's the top of this climb. They sweep the way in and around the side of this stunning building. The slopes here, the source of the river that they're going to be following all the way down out of Vicenza. That's the Baglioni River that uh, rises on its northern slopes, works its way through Vicenza, then heads down in towards Padua or Padova, uh, depending on uh, how you would like to pronounce it. We're going to try and use both here today. So as the riders start to make their way out, the Villa Rotonda ran about uh, six kilometres into this route. And you can see the wooded hills, this uh, classic Renaissance architecture here. In fact, the... Uh, Rotunda, designed uh, by uh, Palladium, who also designed the uh, big uh, church down the side with the uh, big vaulted ceilings. And no time to admire the scenery uh, for Miguel Angel Lopez. He's uh, gone uh, well and truly on the attack. We are now uh, 15 kilometres into the race. Remember, 194 the race distance in total. And the Colombian climber going clear on his own. I'm not sure he wants uh, this to be the tactic. He's not going to do all 194 kilometers, especially as it's uh, predominantly flat lower down on his own. I think he would have hoped to get a few riders, but it will mean that he doesn't need to battle. And the chase group at the moment, well, they're currently going to be about 15 seconds back by the look of that shot as they come around the corner. The crowd's moving out of the way as these riders come around that right-hand turn. Been led around the uh, corner there by uh, Riccardo Chiarini. The uh, Italian just uh, bringing them around that right hand turn onto the tarmac once again. And this course, with about 39% tarmac, there is a uh, gravel, there's compacted asphalt down on there. We've seen some little muddy sections before, and interest in the uh, rider there on that wheelie. Just uh, continue to push and, uh, another move here, a counter-attack coming, and this is uh, coming from Magnus uh, Court Nielsen. So Magnus Court Nielsen, the uh, rider who made a, a real uh, headlines across the world for being uh, the uh, Viking on the attack in the Tour de France. Uh, amazing rider, he's uh, a rider who 
this season really has shown that he's got some amazing skills. We'll see whether or not he is going to be able to make it count out here today. Uh, a rider who uh, got that combative jersey. And probably no surprise to see him out front. Interesting uh, to see that we've got a number of riders in this uh, group making the uh, lead group over the top. It's not uh, the full race field already. It has been whittled down, but for me, the interesting thing here with the gap at 30 seconds is the volume of Italian jerseys on the front. So as we move in now, 20 kilometers, 12 and a half, nearly 13 miles covered, that gap at 30 seconds. The Dane Magnus Court at Nielsen there. Well, he's used to this on the uh, top, but this is not the Tour de France. This is not even one of its roughest, toughest stages. This is the uh, Gravel World Championship, and uh, this is where he's got to make it. Uh, he will want that stripy jersey, he wants to take away the uh, win, but he's got a lot of work to do as they make the way out and around. So Lake Furman, just on the uh, side of Vicenza, you can see the hills rising off the uh, floodplains up into the uh, mountains. Veneto, this whole area, it actually spans from Venice on the coast right the way across through the side of the Dolomites and around to the sides of uh, Lake Garda in the Alps. So it's a huge region in the northeast and uh, these riders crossing a lot of the uh, flat plains. And I think there's going to be some relief for Nielsen and Lopez here because they have been caught. We now have four riders, so Calarato, Beers, Court Nielsen and Moreno in there. So one Italian, one South African, one Dane and one Colombian taking the right-hand turn now. The uh, section here, one of the uh, little narrow sections of a single track that links them to the river bank. Up they go now. We saw problems here for a number of riders in the women's race. They take that turn around. This is a chases on that same section. And that chasing group, well, it looks like it is a pretty active at the moment this very uh, strata bianchi-esque section of the uh, roads we're a long way from Tuscany but we are really um, very much in the heart of uh, seeing a lot of those uh, strata bianchi the white roads the literal translation uh, and a lot of debris coming down so at the moment uh, the road is continuing almost 150k to go that chasing group had swollen. We were seeing more and more riders trying to get across to the big pack of chasers. We then saw a regroup and two riders go clear from those chasers, Gianni Vermeesh and Daniel Oss. Now Gianni Vermeesh, Belgian roadman, Daniel Oss for Italy. Oss, a regular rider of road. Vermeesh, well, He's also very well known for his skills as a cyclocross rider, like a lot of the riders from Belgium and Netherlands growing up riding cyclocross. He has got those skills in there and uh, been lucky enough to be on the uh, microphone and, uh, and see him in action. And you can see at the uh, top there, sealant, so aerosol sealant on the uh, back there of uh, the uh, Daniel Oss of uh, his uh, seat tube. The uh, Vermisha, uh, I think, has uh, gone for the option. If I can't get to a feed zone to get assistance, well, it's going to be game over anyway. These riders are able to ride basically any bike they choose. No e-bikes allowed. One-piece handlebar only, so no bar ends or tri-bars on here, which you sometimes see in stateside uh, races, of course, which is where gravel really did uh, grow up and become uh, super popular. And a lot of those are things that have been brought out in the uh, homeland of Gravel have made the way across, so the riders being self-sufficient. Don't no team cars, no assistance out on the course except for the official feed zones. Well, I think the uh, chasing group here are not so much chases. They're at three minutes, so with a 94k covered, heading towards half a race distance, the riders going through that feed zone, taking it pretty easy. In fact, they could probably stop for a latte. Never mind an espresso as they come through, taking on board some fluids. There, Peter Sagan on the left of your screens, and. Uh, there's some serious chatting going on here. This is not a concerted chase. Sasha Weber uh, just up on the front of that group for Germany, just uh, in discussions about how long are they going to lead these two riders clear up at the front. Oss leading it through as they come in underneath the archway here. And this is one of the most amazing signs. You saw it on the uh, trailer on the run in uh, so we come through. We're in uh, Piazzolo, Schiobretta, and this is the uh, Villa Contarini. The Contarini Villa here actually uh, put together over a long time uh, and uh, 
basically uh, due to uh, uh, Palladio, uh, who did a lot of the work in the area, that Renaissance architecture. He's got some amazing gardens, lights as well, out and round and part of the amazing architecture. These riders are riding past. A lot of tourists out uh, seeing what's going on. Lots of people at the side of the road. Good to see the two kids have spare wheels for a rider, I think, there, as they were at the side of the road. But the riders at the moment making the way through. Two leaders clear. Daniel Oss on the front here. Now, the days when we just had road riders riding road, I think, are pretty much gone, thank goodness. If it ever did really exist, people like Bernard Hino, of course, riding across the uh, French farm tracks. We've had Paris Roubaix. We've had races like Flanders on the cobbles for a long, long time. I grew up riding my bike out. It was a road bike. There weren't such things as mountain bikes back then. In fact, there wasn't even BMXs. And uh, we uh, were out and riding on the tracks and trails. We'd go visit the countryside. We'd go head out to see brand new places to see all the posh houses uh, like uh, we see today and to uh, get out and explore. And that's what gravel really is. It's taken that uh, exploring, it's taken that going out and riding distance on any terrain, whatever you're thrown in front of you, you've got to get over it. And uh, that has uh, translated across from America and here into the riding. And these riders ride everything. You know, they're going to be riding cross. We've seen crossover with mountain bike. I won't put any spoilers out about the finish of the women's race. If you haven't watched it, Please make sure you do. It's a real cracker of a race. So here, as we head over the half-race distance, we see our two leaders here at the 2022 UCI World Gravel Championships. It is Gianni Vermeesh, the Belgian, with the black, yellow and red stripe on that light blue jersey, leading the Italian rider Daniel Oss in that blue jersey jersey. Both riders are with over three minutes to a, a huge chasing group. At this stage, that chasing group numbering nearly 60 riders behind. And in fact, the time gap has gone out even further. It's at five minutes 33. We have covered 100k. Uh, we have, uh, sorry, 130k. We have about 66 to go. And uh, you can see these uh, riders are really now starting to push in towards uh, the Citadella where we are seeing the race. Now, the races in our age groups and the racing in the elite racing that takes place over the entire weekend, while well, that is uh, the same finish line, the difference in the distances are uh, all to do with how many laps they do at the finish. So our women came straight in, uh, I say straight, but they came in around the uh, fortifications of the Citadella and then onto the finish straight in the centre of town our men's elite race while they're going out and around and do two laps on the outside and there is a distance in between in fact for one of our age groups as well so the riders at the moment are trying to stay clear of trouble trying to stay away from doing any damage to those bikes and as you can see we did the two hills at the start we've moved our way in and through through past the Piazzolo Schilbrenta and then heading in to was the Citadel. The first passage coming just under 140k. And of course, our finish line at 194. Now, onto this uh, turn here. This was very loose. It was very dusty yesterday for the women's race. Today, it is even dustier still. There's been no rain overnight. And uh, it is slippery, not because you're going to go sliding on the rock, but because of the volume of dust on baked hard soil, sand, compacted down by the farm tractors, compacted down by the vehicles. Easy to see when you're in a group of one. Sat in the back of this group, you're not going to see very much at all. And uh, you can see at the moment the uh, riders at the back of the pack just taking uh, a chance uh, to uh, pick up uh, some food, to pick up some fuel. And they've got the tarmac section to do that. Our two leaders are already making the way in and through. Five minutes, now five and a half minutes, and these two riders have managed to get steal a march on the riders behind. And in terms of terrain coming up, there are not many big sections that these riders can push to chase down the gap. And that is uh, just simply because there just isn't the space uh, out there. If uh, these riders in the back group want to work together, if they want to work as something akin to a road peloton to bring that gap down, they need the space to work. They need the distance to get that done. At the moment, we can see that it's not very wide, it's not very easy to make that distance, and all of our sections, once we come into the uh, Citadella, are relatively short. There are no really, really long sections of any particular surface, and each transition 
is a, a potential flashpoint where you can have an issue when you drop down you come around a corner it might be broken tarmac it might be a destroyed edge of the uh, grass might be a drop down it might be a drainage ditch it could be a stone a pothole anything like that on any of the transitions where you change from one surface to another will be an issue for these riders so 64k to go our riders are working well at the moment and this is where they're heading the citadella it needs no other name and that's because it's an astounding medieval city here the uh, run around the uh, walls absolutely huge uh, 13th uh, century when it was founded as a military outpost well our riders now starting to head in around the side of the bypass there and they have to work in the way through it's a particularly thin section of single track they're on it rises there are tree roots across the uh, course it's a more technical section it'll suit those with the off-road skills the chasing pack are not all going to fit. They're going to have to go from six riders, seven riders wide, to one rider at a time. And the riders who have wrecked the route, who checked out, are going to be the riders who know what they're doing because look how thin it is. You're not going to go down here side by side. If you do, you're going to be brushing the trees. You're likely to get your handlebars caught. We've all ended up, certainly I have, in the ditch off the side of the course, rolling down the banks because you have tried to overtake at the wrong moment. And you can see on the... Uh, bank here along the side of the rivers alongside the canals each side is built up it's really tough so our motorbike bouncing all over the place to get us these pictures here there is one smooth line on the right there's an additional ride on the left both these riders are able to pick their line you can just see the Mish just takes a little bit of a look alongside there sees whether it's worth coming out so close on that back wheel he can't know whether he's uh, getting the into any danger, whether he's likely to hit something. He's got to trust that Daniel Oss is not going to lead him into something that's going to cause a problem. Oss moves over to the left-hand side. That's traditionally slower line on that little section. Let's have Vermeesh come up and then back across they go. We said this yesterday in the race. And each time you cross that central ridge, central divider from one tyre track lane to another, one rut to another, you a risk of doing damage to the bike. Now, it could be stones, it could be slabs, it could be a hole, it could be a depression, it could just be that you're going to make a mistake as you go over. It changes profile. And you've got a different level of grip, remember, as you go across from one surface to another. And these riders are computing that, they're doing that as they move. But our two leaders, 5 minutes 36, it is still holding. So 60k uh, still to go. That's over 40 miles into the finish. We still have clear Daniel Oss and Gianni Vermees, the two riders who are realistically, I think, are going to be in with a uh, chance if they can stay clear at the back of the pack at the moment. You can uh, just see tucked in there Michael Martin from uh, GB. He's uh, just on the uh, shoulder there of uh, Lachlan Morton, two riders who uh, know each other uh, well. They've been uh, riding a lot of gravel uh, as they've come around. And uh, interesting to see that they are just uh, tucked on the back. They're maybe not wanting to fight it out at the front. The problem is they could be in to the dusty farm tracks. They're going to be into those narrows very soon. And this is where we could see a selection made. If you're in the bunch on the front, as it comes down, you get the view. You get to carry your own pace, your own speed. Behind you, you're going to be braking to get in there. And this is the distance between them. Head of the race taking on board food and fuel. Another of our official stops here on the way around the race. So... The riders are well on the way here at the uh, World Gravel Championships here in Veneto in Italy, in the northeast corner of Italy, heading around this tarmac section before they head off road once again. You can just see at the moment Vermish low over those bars, the taller figure of Oss just hiding behind, and you can see just how experienced they are. Look how close those tyres are, those wheels are. They spend a lot of time riding together, both riders having a ridden. Uh, big tours this year and uh, you can just see at the moment uh, Dan Daniel Oss uh, showing why he's uh, such a, a great rider to uh, follow he uh, is just taking a little bit of a look across at Vermeesh here and they come around this uh, turn now Vermeesh takes it slightly tighter on the way around he goes in Y comes out uh, tight and dodging the uh, barrels dodging the uh, concrete blocks that uh, form part of this urban architecture as the chasing group. Well, this is the uh, peloton 
the big group of chasers that were behind. You can see them strung out into the distance. I think our motorbike is probably about 400 metres behind the front of this group. It's working hard here just to stay with them. And this is the difficulties on a gravel race. The problems our motorbike is facing, it's exactly the same for the riders. As we see, our leaders are now coming alongside the uh, bypass. Got underneath it here, then they're going to take the uh, right-hand turn. They're going to climb up alongside it. And uh, it's uh, got a little bit of a riser here. And uh, you can see the size of the stones and the rocks at the side. Pick a smooth line, you're going to go through cleanly. Get that line wrong, you're going to be in trouble. And Vermeesh using some power now to open up a little bit of a gap on us. Os has got to respond to this. There should be enough uh, now in this uh, little uh, section here, this single track, this long run, a single track for Os to power his way back onto Vermeesh. But very interesting, the kick up the bank, saw Vermeesh put the power down and open the gap up on Os. Os not carrying maybe quite as much pace round into it. He's onto the back wheel, but is that a portent of what's to come? So down past Cowbells, our leaders go. That big group behind strung out, and uh, we wait to see what has happened behind the, our leaders. So at the moment, uh, our road is continuing. Oh, there's a summary there. You can see of the race, unpaved roads, uh, 36%. The asphalt, the tarmac, 27% on this course in total with the inclusion of those two laps on the end. The course actually being updated just coming into the weekend. And uh, it certainly means these riders with a real mix of surfaces. They've got to be adept, not just at riding, but at racing on all of these surfaces. And uh, if, like me, regular rider on gravel, regular rider on the road, on the track, on the, the mountain bike, every time you ride a bike and you're riding it out, it takes a little bit of time to get used to that bike, but the skills that you require are different and the way you would make that bike handle. If you're riding a mountain bike through a muddy section, you would drive that different to a cross bike. You'd ride it different to a gravel bike. The Where the grip is on the tyre, how much grip there is, how fast you can throw, how much you lean those bikes is something that only comes with time. Well, they're going to have had a lot of time on these dusty sections, on the bike tracks and on the farm tracks here today to get used to that bike. But when we go into the Citadel, you're going to see we have some very different terrain. There's sections of the moat that very World Cup cyclocross-esque. And don't forget, of course, we have the World Cup uh, starting. It's in Waterlooville in uh, the uh, States for the uh, cyclocross. And that's uh, this uh, weekend. Lots of great coverage of that going to be coming out. But the riders heading in. And as you can see, coming out from Vicenza over those hills, the twisting nature of the course already, though the uh, major twists, turns and hairpins in the hills, then headed down in towards uh, Padua, or Padova, as it's known, as coming up uh, back along the uh, Brenta River, heading in towards the Citadella. But then once we're in, we head around the circuit. Uh, at the moment, the uh, riders are just uh, making the way from where the loop rejoins the uh, initial run in through the bypass section and coming around in towards the town centre. So one of our link bits of tarmac of asphalt at the moment for our leaders. Less than 60 kilometres to go to the finish. And as you can see, most of the height gain that is uh, done now is in the uh, rampart and on the sides of uh, the Citadella itself, uh, rather than heading out into the surrounding countryside. These two leaders still looking good. Five uh, minutes at 38. Now, tactics between these two. Well, they're going to have to keep riding at the moment. They know the power and the pace of the group are behind. Gianni Vermish has got a good sprint on him. I've seen uh, Gianni uh, sprint uh, before. He's a rider who uh, we uh, know has got some serious kick. He's a rider who uh, can uh, lead out... Uh, uh, for others, he's a rider who can ride very, very uh, well over long distances or well. And uh, he's also a rider who's got some serious miles in his legs uh, this season. Now, uh, his season on the road, uh, starting uh, back on the UAE Tour back in February, uh, running right the way through. In fact, his last uh, race was uh, only on the 4th of October. That's the uh, uh, Bianchi Shime Bianchi, uh, the uh, Frank Vanderbrook Memorial, uh, where he was uh, racing. But a busy week for him with the uh, Famen Arden Classic as well. Now, the leading riders 
are long gone. The group behind is fractured all over the road. A motorbike taking the chance to go up alongside the Eurasia. Going past, I think, Toby Perry, just seen on the right-hand side of the group, just coming up here on the back of this group as they come in. Well, the motorbike's managed to make a little bit of ground. He's just uh, sitting immediately behind uh, Michael, uh, Mikhail Stania of uh, Slovenia in that green jersey. But there aren't groups even further up the road and is moving out of the way. Very smart move here uh, by the bikes. The experienced pilots uh, practicing, uh, making sure that they did a, a recce of this course. And now uh, speaking to the team, they were out on the course for a couple of days before the start of the race, making sure that they knew every twist and turn, every lump and bump on the way through. He's met a lot of the riders actually when they were out on uh, course practice as well. Not all the riders managing to get the course down first time. A number of riders getting lost, in fact, in Vicenza uh, on the way through. But uh, hopefully our riders won't have any uh, problems this time. Now, we talked about Gianni for me having a good sprint. Uh, Oss, no more for his uh, long distance uh, uh, riding, for his uh, long distance attacks. A rider who, of course, has uh, ridden uh, races like the Tour de France. Uh, his uh, season started back in February as well in the uh, Saudi Tour. Uh, been through the uh, Maritime Devar, through the classic season. Finished the uh, Paris-Roubaix. Eighth in the uh, Italian Championships before heading uh, to the Tour de France. And uh, his uh, best stage finish, 23rd there up in Denmark on the uh, road from Roskilde to uh, Nyborg. But uh, of late in the uh, season, riding a very similar programme with uh, the, the uh, Femen uh, Classic and the uh, Bianchi, uh, Chimay Bianchi uh, race. Putting the top watch you, Charant, uh, as well. And... Uh, it's an area I know well. He did that in uh, August, but that is an area well suited to training for this. Very similar roads, very similar profile. The hills of the Dordogne to the south that you can go uh, hit, and then a big flat plains in between with very dusty gravel roads. And uh, I think uh, that will have been uh, good preparation, at least in terms of altitude gain, even if it wasn't uh, great in terms of practicing riding on the gravel. And it adds another dimension. If you think you can ride 190k on the road, so gravel will be easy, think again. This, one of the less technical courses. It's definitely one with smaller stones and rocks, but there's no mud on the course because of the dry weather we've been having. But even so, it is so much harder than riding on the tarmac. The speed difference is huge. The amount of power that you need to push out and the amount of work you need to do with your body to stabilize the bike is so much less on the tarmac. Any weaknesses, any niggles, any injuries at the back end of a road season, anything that you've maybe got wrong in practice for the cyclocross season, anything that's an injury when you've come out of the mountain bike season is going to show when you're going and racing for 190 plus K here in the Gravel World Championships. So I'll lead us with that same time gap still showing at the moment. This is the uh, chasing uh, peloton or the remnants of it. It has been blown apart by that uh, narrow section. You see the motorbike really pushing on. That's Miguel Angel Lopez. We've just gone past through Lysenko. I think it was so just being passed on the left uh, of the uh, motorbike as they come around this uh, turn. And the bike's going to have a, a real tough job just to find where the front of uh, the uh, chasing group is out there. And uh, one of the challenges, of course, with gravel racing I say exploded, and uh, if uh, you think back uh, to 2006, 2007, it was races like the Almanzo 2007, there were a handful of finishes. You know, Hurl Everston coming in at uh, 7 hours 45 on a uh, single stop fixed uh, wheel bike uh, comes in. Uh, he was, uh, by, that's by 2007. You move forward to now, we've got races around the globe. You've got a massive scene in the uh, States, including a full pro scene with people winning big up money. And a lot of the riders are racing professionally around the uh, around the season, and uh, a huge amount of uh, media following as well. But what makes it very difficult to cover is, of course, the uh, the TV coverage because our bikes and our cameras have to dive in that chase group there with Matthew Vanderpol still working to pull back our leaders. But have they left it too little, too late? Because up at the front of the race, our two leaders are well clear. 
So now we come in to the defences. You can see the walls of the Citadella for the first time. Our riders will soon be across on to the banking on the outside, that moat that surrounds the outside, the water surrounding the outside, crossed by the bridge. But our riders will be making the way in and over that bridge. They take a left-hand turn. Interesting move there uh, by Vermeesh. I was uh, pushed it a long way wide to go uh, in and narrow as it came in and round. And uh, just uh, going to take a little bit of a look down. I don't think there's an issue with the bike now. This is where we start to see them make the way around the outside of the ramparts. You can see there's a right-hand turn down single track. This is where they're going to come down. Now, there are two riders here, two riders. This is the run into the finish room. They're going to have a dress rehearsal now of the run in. Uh, they're going to do time and time again. Remember, this tight left-hand turn here. And make sure in the women's race you're watching down here, if you're watching the coverage, the motorbike happens to take a wider line in uh, through underneath the uh, vineyards there as the uh, riders come down the side. And at the moment, those two riders pretty much together. Interesting uh, to see how tight Vermish was going to the right-hand side there. They're searching uh, for all of the sections, and that is the uh, Flam Rouge, the red uh, kite. That is at 1k from the actual finish line, which means that these riders know when they hit that line, they've got uh, twice more round. So our helicopter tracking up above the riders here today, led by Gianni Vermeesh, second in the uh, duo. It is a taller figure of Daniel Os Os, the Italian on home turf. Italy are looking to take a win here. And you see the spectators, a grandstand view off the bridge as the riders come in and through. I expect to see them all sprint from one side to the other. <laughs> they do. Good job. That bridge has got firm foundations as in come our riders around this turn. Spectators get ready to get out of the way. You can see them all up on the bank in here, uh, cheering the riders on. One wrong move, of course, and they'll end up in the drink. The turn is barriered and they're going to come in, I reckon, really tight here. Now you can just uh, see, Vermeesh goes wide, up the rutted uh, route goes uh, Os. So Vermeesh carrying pace around the outside, using that slightly wider outside line. And you can see the stones getting fl flung up from the uh, motorbike and from the wheels of our riders. And this is where the riders get a real good feel for how this is going to be a little bit later on. This is a 300 meter to go, a marker as you come in underneath the bridge, you hit that 250 meter, the 200 meter. And these are key markers as they come down in towards the finish. 200 meters, just the other side of the gateway in the side as they come in on to the circuit. So they're gonna have two laps to go, 27 and a half K each time. So here we go, Daniel Oss with Gianni Vermeesh, their first passage of the finishing line. The crowd outside absolutely packing the barriers here. They get a good look at these riders who have still got five minutes. And uh, you can imagine that Oss is uh, going to get some serious support here at the site in uh, the Italian state of Veneto, the northeast of Italy, playing host to the 2022 championships the world championships uh, of uh, the gravel discipline here in benito the uci uh, on for the first time we have uh, had uh, previous championships gravel worlds an event over in the uh, states are so really hosting the best riders uh, for well over a decade and uh, really bringing the uh, teams all and the riders in uh, to the uh, scene and uh, the team there doing an amazing job. Now we have the first official UCI, the governing body for all of cycling in the uh, across the globe, have now taken on board gravel and uh, bringing it across into Europe. And of course, we have the World Series as well, the 11 events around the globe, bringing that racing out to the Philippines, across to Australia, to Poland, to Sweden, go back to the homeland of uh, the. Uh, Gravel at the Highlands are classic now. This big group of riders having to contend with the road furniture moving out and round. None of those riders uh, uh, seen uh, motorbike out riders stood there waving yellow flags. This is gravel. This is about negotiating what's in front of you. It's not about that pampered existence that some of our riders on the course at the moment will have felt inside the uh, road. Interesting to see Vermeesh putting on board uh, some more fuel. Just reaching in underneath the uh, saddle there. Looks like a, a subseat stash uh, there. 
and uh, just uh, Richard to pull that out from between saddle rails and the uh, saddle itself. Now riders moving away from this. Uh, so the first of our two laps here. So the helicopter now are focused on our riders in that pack and this is where it's going to get very interesting indeed because you were at the back here with the motorbike but the leaders will already be dropping down in towards those lower slopes and at the back you can see the riders are nowhere near coming into the corners and the leaders are already coming in and uh, through the lower slopes and I think at least one rider going really wide on the way round there as they come through and the volume of riders means they can't all take the uh, smooth line and you can see riders here having to take the feet out just to stabilize just in case they do get bumped on the way uh, through you see like Morton doing that uh, on the way down there and still the leaders push on now there will have been a battle to get near the front of this group coming in at the town but uh, there is a chance for a regroup but they're lined out here and our motorbike absolutely cutting it down the side, trying to catch up with those riders. But they've got to push on here. They're going to want to be into this next right-hand turn. They go underneath the first bridge. They come around further around. The entrance is uh, to the Citadella with the bridges on each of the quarters of the compass. Here, uh, alongside those uh, battlements, our riders are riding right at the lowest point down by the side of the uh, moat surrounded by amazing architecture but they have no time to look about they've got to stay focused here not least because they could uh, end up clattering in some of the urban furniture that's out and around the uh, exercise equipment based out and around the sides of uh, the old defenses here so here we go up on to the uh, climb. You can see uh, people like uh, Court Nielsen in the mix. It looks to me like uh, we still got Sagan in uh, that uh, group as uh, well. Still fighting uh, to uh, push the way up on uh, to the climb. Toby Perry in there for the uh, UK as well, right in that chase in a group. So this is group number two. Van der Poel in that group just going in and through. And you can just see... And then a little bit of a look over the shoulder, a flick of the elbow there. And uh, riders uh, not wanting to sit on the front for any length of time or whatsoever. The Italians are quite happy to take that up, but at the moment, you can just see a pushing in uh, through. Uh, another big push. These riders are just coming down. They can see the gaps opening, and now they've got to get on that train really quickly indeed. So our groups coming through, you can see the damage that has been uh, done here, the uh, distance that has been opened up on the uh, way through here and uh, some serious damage having been uh, done to the riders. So after the mix, uh, Hass right up in the mix, Ballerini in the mix, uh, Christensen Van Alvema up there as well. A lot of these riders who we did expect to be in the uh, group still in that leading group of chasers however they're still giving up away nearly five minutes to the riders in front just looking to see if anybody major missing from that big chasing pack at the moment cut nielsen in there kalmajan in there stevie in there steve are in that uh, perry we've seen and looks like uh, lawrence nason in there south african and mark pritson in that big chasing group as well paul voss So like uh, Quintanilla in from Spain, Lakata from Austria in the mix, uh, Julian uh, Tarioa from uh, France in that chasing the group. And remember, three medals at stake, the only two riders up the road. There's still a medal, even if they don't bring back the group. But would you want to tow a rider like Sagan, like Van der Poel into that finish? I don't think I would want to be anywhere in the vicinity if they were unleashing the sprint because uh, you know they're going to be good. Right. Who else is in this uh, leader chasing group? Matt Beers is in there from South Africa. We've got our Australian rider, Lachlan Morton, who we've seen. Now Robin uh, Frodvo in uh, from Sweden. Voisard in there from Sweden. Uh, Khmer in uh, from France. Miguel Angel Lopez. As uh, we saw them coming in through those lines, the gap starts to open up behind uh, uh, riders like uh, Morton, and that's where 
we're seeing uh, the riders who are really struggling to stay with the pace dropped off the pack as they came through matt bird of australia starting to lose touch ivar slick going uh, off there uh, ivar of uh, uh, unbound fame the uh, winner this year main distance uh, ricardo chahini of italy uh, david uh, revelin uh, going out that group as well Looks uh, like uh, Michael Mottram being distance, and uh, it's only a matter of a few seconds to come in through the line, but that is critical as they go out. It's still a big chasing group reforming in front of you on your screens. However, it is uh, going to be uh, very interesting to see what they do across the road. Lots of debate in that pack, and they're going to try and work this out. And I think this is where this group has suffered previously. Because there are two riders at the front, and another attack goes to the left-hand side, and I think this is uh, going to start to uh, be what we're going to see. It's one of the few areas where a big group can work together, but they're sat up across the road, and at uh, 4 minutes 43, this is very dangerous territory. You can just see uh, you're getting uh, Fedorov uh, just to the back there. You've got Matthew Vanderpol tucked in this group as well. Toby Perry just uh, in there, the long hair, blue shorts, uh, and that light blue helmet taking that right hand turn. And if you're at the back of the uh, group, somebody attacks off the front and a few people make it across. That's another group up the road, and that could be a chance of a bronze medal, if not catching back the fight for gold and silver gone. So with less than 50 kilometers to go here and the 2020 a 2022 UCI World Cyclocross. It's a World Cyclocross. That's coming up soon. The World uh, Gravel Championships. It's a lot longer than your average cyclocross race, believe me. Uh, cyclocross uh, taking an hour. This uh, has uh, taken a lot longer at the moment as they came through our last uh, split. The uh, race uh, time for our leaders on the first time through the uh, finishing line. Three hours, 43 and 20 seconds for Daniel Oss, who led them over that finish line for the first time. Much longer. The uh, two leaders clear. Managing to find uh, the odd puddle down on this uh, track a little bit stickier. So that means we're going to have uh, a little bit more water, a little bit more moisture coming up. That will uh, stick in. I don't think we're going to see issues with gears. A lot of these bikes running all sorts of setups uh, from a one bike setup. So quite often seeing a single large gravel or road chain ring, maybe even a uh, double chain set on the front, but on the back of the bike, bigger sprockets on there to uh, cope. A big, long cage rear make, massively uh, loose gravel there. Well, somebody uh, clearly decided that their driver would be looking very nice with their uh, chippings going down, stop it getting muddy in the winter, but that is very slippery indeed. And uh, if a rider gets that wrong and goes down in this big group, and that is going to cause all sorts of problems for the riders. So down on to the farm tracks here, a little bit further out, you see the ploughed fields either side of the riders. The tracks are still much thinner than you see on something like Paris Bay or Flanders, but really taking in a lot of the training tracks and trails a lot of the local riders will use. That's how we all started off, and uh, I was uh, listening, in fact, uh, to one of the uh, Pirate Cycling League founders over from the States on the uh, Gravel Family uh, podcast, and uh, really interesting to hear uh, how he got into promoting events, and it was about going to an event, getting a ride and having some good results, and thinking, oh, I want to bring people out and ride around my local area on the tracks and trails that I ride, and I think uh, he was dead right when he said, that's how a lot of these events start, it's how a lot of these uh, people get used to the uh, riding now. Great to see the local cyclists out helping our guys not take the straight on down the straight, making sure they take that uh, turn on to the side of the field here. This farmer track are getting uh, even rougher. So this is where the riders who can keep the power down, who can ride at things like cobbles, who can ride off-road, are going to be able to move. Super lightweight riders tend to get bounced about. I work on that all the time. And that is uh, why if you... Uh, have a little bit more power, you stay seated, you push, you only push up into a slightly larger gear, not maybe spin around at such high cadence, high pedal revs, just to keep the power down, because none of this is going to really knock you offline. It's not going to bring you down in speed too much. When you hit it, it's about keeping the power smooth so that you are able to get as much power out of that back wheel without it skipping about. Now, you can just see Daniel Oss here racing. 
the uh, bike in there. Not needed uh, that certain. Hopefully not going to need it uh, before the end of the race. Remember, the ride is self-sufficient in gravel, except for those official zones. For Misha, uh, indicating now, it doesn't need to worry about the traffic at least, but uh, still <laughs> indicates to us which direction they're heading. And so these two still are working together. It's often uh, one of the uh, signs that... Uh, they're not working in the uh, motorbike. One of the uh, team of race officials just thanking the riders for moving over to uh, one side on the way through. So this constant transition from asphalt to gravel to chippings to stone to farm track back across into asphalt coming time and time again. There are so many sectors on the way through for our riders. A uh, total of uh, 60 sectors uh, out and around the course uh, in uh, total, in, including uh, both of our laps. Each lap having uh, a uh, number of sectors in it. In fact, each lap having 10 sectors of off-road as well as the asphalt and the uh, compacted sections in between. And you can just see this, the motorbike suffering the same thing the riders do. As you come into a com corner, there's a compression. All the riders start to bunch up. You can't brake at the perfect time. You lose your speed. You then open up the gas on the front whilst the guys at the back are coming into the corner. You spread it back out again. And then it compresses coming into the next corner. And that constant compression acceleration. If you're at the front of the group, you are going to be able to make the most of the pace and the power. If you are a rider at the back, you are going to be answering the call of everybody else in front of you. And every time they do it, it might only be a fraction of a second. It's going to take its effect because you are going to be sprinting out of each corner at a suboptimum time. You're going to be coming into the corner and breaking in at suboptimum moment. You're going to be breaking early. You're going to be coming in at a longer time after the riders in front. And that is where that compression and expansion eventually will break. If you're at the back of the group, you're not going to be with the riders who matter. Now, the gap is coming down. We're at 4 minutes, 37 seconds, 45 kilometres to go. So about 26 and a half miles, if my uh, mental arithmetic serves me right in terms of uh, mileage uh, still to go. The height gain is uh, negligible for these uh, riders now that they're on to the uh, finishing circuit. There is a height raise and drop, but it is uh, not enough to trouble a riders of the quality that we've got in this uh, group, that chasing group containing a mix of uh, cyclocross road and uh, gravel specialists. But up at the front, it's uh, two uh, riders who uh, really have uh, set their careers out of being road riders. Daniel Oss and uh, Gianni Vermeesh. They're on the left of your screen, right-hand side, that chasing, well, what's left of the peloton. We're still awaiting our next uh, pack uh, Time check through to uh, give us some numbers in that group. So as they came in uh, through the uh, line, those uh, 40 or so, 50 or so riders that came in together, as they came through the uh, line for the first uh, time, we're starting to stretch to get strung out. I suspect we're not going to find uh, this group has uh, managed to maintain all of those numbers by the time we get back in and through. Remember that running has a drop down around the ramparts, down off the edge of the Citadel, down to the mountain back up again, and that will split the group again. So this group's still looking big, still looks like it's uh, at least 40, 45 riders. I think pretty much everybody getting back together in that uh, group. Uh, so we see Os and Vermeesh taking a left hand turn once again. Amazing part of the world to come and explore. Had the uh, had a good luck to be racing in and around Italy. You've raced not far from uh, Garda and into the Alps as well as in some of the uh, more uh, flatter areas. Thank goodness, because uh, there's plenty of climbs uh, to be had. And I've got to say, great place to come and ride. Great tracks and trails as well as roads to explore. Bring your gravel bike. Come on down, ride on the uh, trails. Head up. You've got big trails in the mountains. You've got big hills, you've got some really tough mountain biking terrain. We're not all that far from the Alps, we're not far from Leger, where we've seen the Mountain Bike World Championships, the UCI Mountain Bike World Championships take place. We're not all that far uh, from Switzerland, where we saw the hour record, the men's hour record, get smashed to smithereens by uh, Filippo Ghana. So in the uh, go, taking that left-hand turn. Interesting hand signal there. Uh, from uh, Simon uh, de Valencia, 
from uh, Belgium. And that was a yeah, all over for me. I'm not going to be uh, contesting this one. It's a sort of general uh, across the throat so action generally means it's all over. We'll see, uh, let's see if that uh, is going to be the uh, cases group staying together on this section, but we know it's going to thin back down once again. Our chasers here in Veneto on the outskirts of Citadella making the way along. So the tall figure in the orange, not quite as uh, bright primary uh, Type colour oranges uh, you would normally uh, see, so uh, not the normal bright orange of the Netherlands. Uh, the rider two in up, so uh, the rider just ahead of our rider with the blue band across his back in that light white and orange. It's got little orange dots actually on the skin suit. That is uh, Ivar who is on his way through. Ivar Slick, uh, an unbound winner, uh, dedicated uh, gravel rider. In this chasing group, the gap still over four and a half minutes. And look at the riders are back. They're just having to freewheel in. They're just taking all of that pace off. Guys at the front, several hundred meters down the uh, route as they come out from every single corner due to the size of this pack. And uh, I think we're starting to see one or two riders not like this uh, constant kick back out of the corner. Just seen uh, Riccardo Chiarini here from Italy, just on the uh, back of this group, just uh, starting to uh, lose contact. And I think by the body language, maybe not quite as comfortable as uh, he would want to be at this uh, stage. And once you're at the back, you're not just uh, unable to see, you're breathing in all that dust, all that debris. The riders at the end of the women's race covered with uh, dust from head to toe, absolutely uh, covered in it like at uh, the end of a uh, long, long, tough day. And uh, that's exactly what these guys have had as well. A long, hard day. You just see the uh, riders going over there. They couldn't move to the side because they're in a big group. There's none of this dodging what's in front of you. It's not very easy to do. Looks like uh, issues uh, here. And this, I think, is a chain off there for the uh, Frenchman. He's reaching down with his front uh, to the front to the chain ring with his right hand there, stopping. Uh, and I think going to be putting the uh, putting on uh, the uh, chain there. So. The uh, bumps, those were the uh, bunny hop little sections that go over those uh, puddles, over those ruts. In the group, you can't see what you're doing. You hit one of those wrong, you bounce on it wrong. Just as you're changing gear, or you're easing off on the pressure on the pedals, that chain will come off. If the chain comes off, well, you have to just uh, push back a little bit on the pedals. As it uh, goes over the bump, you can find that chain will fly off, and then you're in trouble. And that is one of the problems that these riders who have got road equipment on their bikes rather than mountain bike or gravel-specific equipment will find. So the rear gear that moves the chain across from the different colts on the back, the sprockets to the back, the road equipment has basically a spring, and it's sprung tension. It holds the tension on the chain. What you have within a mountain bike or within a gravel rear gear is a bush which actually has a whole load of friction in it. It's known as a clutch, but essentially it's a wound up adjustment that stops it from just bouncing backwards and forwards. And you've got to put a lot of force to move it. It stops your chain from coming off as easily. So if you choose it. Now the uh, riders there just uh, asking for a time check and uh, getting the uh, four minutes, uh, I think we've been told 4.50 there, the, the uh, motorbike behind. The motorbike uh, riders uh, not uh, having uh, official time checks on the way through the roads. Uh, they're used to that on the uh, road and uh, they know the uh, TV crews really well to uh, pester them and uh, try and find out the information uh, from them. So taking that left-hand turn round goes the bunch. Interesting that we've got our Austrian rider on the back here. That's Moran Vermeulen. Uh, just uh, to, to the back of this group, the uh, riders at the back not able to make the way up or through past the uh, riders in front. Nobody's going to give up position very easily. These two, though, you can see Vermeesh just takes a wider line, goes out to take a wide line now. Nothing to say. Our riders have to stay to the gravel. You can see a beaten track there around that corner, and uh, that is where you might well see riders go and take a different line. It's a risky line, but it cuts the corner. And uh, there's no tape to say they can't do that, but it's a gamble. And will we see anybody do that as they come onto one of these rougher sections here? And you can see the riders just trying to search out some smooth sections. When it's dusty, the dust will settle. It'll form you a little bit smoother section, sometimes where the grass grows down into the rocks. And it binds together the surface 
it can be that little bit smoother. But every now and then, if you pick that grass line, you won't see a big hole or a big stone. And it's always a gamble. You ride along thinking to yourself, where should I be? Should I be on this? And that's what's going to be going through the most roads. How can I maximise my speed? How, what is the safest line? How can I get my bike to this finish in one piece? This rough section, the riders are on. Four minutes and a half minutes after them, our pack are going to hit it. And that's going to be a whole different game in a bunch of 40 to 50 riders coming in to this section. And remember, this is just lap number one of two around the Citadella here on the uh, 2022 Gravel World Championships. The UCI first uh, embracing the uh, World Championships and extending it to the uh, Gravel discipline. And of course, we've seen uh, lots of new disciplines joining things like eSports and uh, being hosted uh, by Zwift. Uh, we, of course, joining the more traditional cycling disciplines like road and time trial, the track. We've got mountain bike, of course, involved. Uh, we saw the uh, XCE Eliminator World Championships in Barcelona uh, not all that long ago. We've got the World Track Championships taking place next week as well. So lots of uh, disciplines all covered up by the UCI, the governing body. And this is the first of the UCI World Championships, which has really uh, come on the back of a, a massive explosion of development and probably, I think, uh, a worldwide understanding that what most people actually ride is gravel. Most people in the world ride wherever they can. That's not on the fastest, slickest, super quick main roads. It's on the tracks, the trails. They go out and explore. They go out with their friends and they chat. And uh, you can listen to uh, somebody who's uh, come from a mountain bike and uh, adventure uh, background, somebody like Rebecca Rush, uh, who a lot of people know from the Blood Road film and the work she's uh, done with the Be Good charity. Well, what Rebecca Rush uh, found when she went out and rode. She really was going out and riding on gravel. It was why you get into it in the first place is going out and having fun and uh, are now inducted into the uh, Gravel Hall of Fame. Uh, and uh, great to see that she is on uh, the uh, Gravel Hall of Fame and uh, quite rightly so. And actually went to accept that by riding there with a whole group of friends. What, uh, what better way uh, to uh, make your way in and uh, get a part of history? And it's history today that's going to be set. We saw our first women's champion crowned yesterday. The first of those medals handed out to our women elite riders. We're going to see the men's elite uh, riders being crowned now. Will it be one of these two riders? It's looking more and more likely. Never discount the power of a bunch behind. Never discount the power of a pack behind but it's not excessively windy. Remember, the wind speeds here are low. They're talking 13 kilometers an hour. That is uh, about eight miles an hour. You're talking a very, very low speeds. The uh, weather today, pretty uh, good to uh, race. A little bit cooler than yesterday. The race uh, finish in uh, finish yesterday was at 24 degrees. We saw uh, riders in that front group pouring water across themselves. Our leaders at the moment showing no sign of doing that speed at the moment. When you see on a motorbike, 50 kilometers an hour. That is uh, just under 30 miles an hour. In fact, 53k is 30 miles an hour as uh, our riders go through. A lot of people always put K on their bikes on one of them just because it looks faster and it makes you feel faster. These two don't need any uh, tricks. They are absolutely motoring here. And uh, you can just see that bigger chain ring engage for both of these riders. I think that, yep, both riding uh, double chain set on here. Of the uh, two, uh, the uh, Canyon uh, bike at the uh, back with the, uh, the very distinctive uh, rear seat state and uh, seat tube uh, junction. Now, interesting technical section there, just popping up on to the banking. Interesting enough, without anybody running in and through, very dangerous option, this pace these riders are going. Now, look at this single track section here. Now, the riders will know this is coming up. If they don't know it and they haven't wrecked it before today, they certainly will when they come around next lap. It's going to be a key part coming into that section to be on the front. And it's pressure. It's a bit like a classics race. The pressure goes on before the technical section. It doesn't happen just when you hit that technical section. It happens before then. Look at this. We've seen the riders go and cut the corner. We said this could be a critical section. They have a well and truly done that. You can see a rider down on the floor with a bike in uh, with issues there. 
that the pace of the riders coming around, cutting that corner off, there is no uh, compunction on the riders to stay on the uh, gravel stuff as they come in and round. But you wouldn't try and ride across a ploughed field. It's going to slow you down. But look at the damage that's being done here. We said this was a rough session. This is where it's going to tell. Those riders who've got the skills to pay the bills are going to fly. It's going to be really, really interesting to see uh, where they are move. It's uh, looking good at the moment. Let's see who is uh, going uh, to uh, be a uh, distance here. The damage is being done behind and the chase is on to get back in. So as those riders uh, continue to accelerate out that rough section continues here, this is rough. They've got big stones, you've got big potholes. We've seen at least one great cover. They go over the top of it in this section. So that's where a drainage ditch goes through. There's an inspection section on top. As our leaders continue up on the top of the flood banking here, this is to stop the rivers from flooding. It's nice and bone dry at the moment, but the water that's collected in the Dolomites and the Alps in the hills will come down at pace and the river will rise. This is to stop that from happening. Now, you can imagine this on your local trail, going out, bezing down this on your mountain bike, on your gravel bike, on your cross bike. Uh, if it was me, it'd probably be on my road bike because I'm uh, over-ambitious in my skill level and what my bike can handle. And you bring, I bring the wrong bike, but there we go. I'll be looking for the speed and you come flying down this. Now, when you get it wrong, when you're on your own, it's not too bad. You imagine you're, champion, you're in a world championship, the pressure that's on you to get down that track, to stay ahead. Our two riders are doing it well. The group behind it, they're going to be all over the place. And I think we are going to see uh, some serious carnage once we hit that. It was bad enough going over those rocks and over the uh, corner of the edge of the field. And remember, of course, gravel encompasses such a wide range of terrains. So we see some of the uh, races, uh, some of the stateside stuff. Uh, it is basically almost full on mountain biking at times. And the uh, riders, sections of them bound this year with riders having to get off and push the bikes. There were two really big, heavy showers in that and on bad over in the States. We've seen races like Cape Epic. A lot of the riders on the mountain bike marathon, a lot of those riders actually yeah, come across from the uh, gravel and ride. Not everybody. Uh, John Bustleman, a uh, great interview with him. I was listening to recently where he was saying he's not a mountain bike, especially he can imagine riding it, but not winning it. And uh, that's true for a lot of people. Now, this group has fractured as they've come out from that technical section. Our motorbike taking the long way round here. It's going to lose a little bit of ground to that uh, chasing group. You can see we've got one big group behind. We've got a, a little group, a uh, trio of chasers in here, just trying to spot some numbers. Still a big pack at the front of the chasing group. So this is what's left of that peloton. We have seen riders in trouble I remember, of course, it only takes a one issue as the pace halts up now. The riders clearly doing a turn on the front and swinging off out of the way. Will anybody else take it up? If they hesitate, there are three riders and there's a big pack of riders who will come back onto them. They cannot afford to do that. Who's up here? Well, you see Van der Poel uh, just on the right. He's about uh, sixth wheel at the moment. Looks like Court is in the mix here and really interesting to see. Look at those uh, Danish jerseys there, three in a row. Those are like slick up here as well. So uh, really interesting to see now, Matthew Van der Poel. Uh, I think if we put his full Palmares on the screen, we'd need most of the rest of the programme. He's the bigger of the two uh, Dutch riders in that uh, slightly orangely wash kit going through. It's like somebody's just dipped in a little bit of uh, orange juice rather than it being uh, dyed with carrots, that's for sure. As the riders make the way round, they, it looks like Van der Poel starting to get his uh, teammates, countrymen, to do some work. Our two leaders, though, continue to push here. Well, it's a bit wider, a little bit of respite, a little bit more room for manoeuvre, a little bit less pressure, but they can't afford to lose concentration. There's a reason why most accidents in mountaineering are on the way back down off the mountains. There's a reason why... In football, the goals get scored towards the end of the game. It's at the end of the effort, the end, when you start to relax a bit too much. If you're in the lead, potentially, when you're tired, when you're fatigued, that's when you're going to make mistakes. It's always towards the end. Very rare. It happens at the start of the racing. Now, are these two continuing to push, or are we seeing a little bit of easing off? There's 35K, just under 35 kilometres to go. 
So that is just over 20 miles to our race finish. Daniel Oss, the big Italian behind her, the more compact Gianni Vermiche on the sides of the river coming back down the Brenta at the moment they will come into a town uh, on the side of the river they're going to take a left hand turn to come back up by the uh, bypass on that uh, little single track section through the uh, woods then to take the right and left over the bypass then head into towards the citadel and those twists and turns the tight turns on the side of the ramparts for the run in over the uh, line for the uh, Bell as they head out onto their last lap. That is still to come because at the moment you can see Daniel Oss on the back here for Italy. A rider who has had an amazing net Palmares. Top 10 in Milan, San Remo. He's uh, taken uh, top uh, positions uh, fourth in the uh, Tour de France back in 2011. Uh, he's uh, a rider who has uh, ridden uh, so many uh, different races. Again, we're going top 10 back in 2015. Have a still riding strongly uh, and uh, doing more domestic work, but also riding uh, for fun as well. A real character. And this is where he's heading for. He's heading for the Citadella. The question is, will he and Gianni Vermiche, another rider who, uh, although slightly younger, has uh, been uh, a regular rider on the uh, big stage, Vermisha just took to the back here and uh, a rider who uh, we have uh, seen uh, sitting in the uh, glass door uh, Hethkeland uh, this year at uh, his season uh, very similar at the back end of the season in fact Daniel Oster could have been pretty much rooming together if they weren't on different teams as they came in things like the Primus Classic riding the Vuelta and uh, taking a third uh, on uh, the uh, stage uh, that was uh, the uh, stage uh, coming in, stage 19. So that's the uh, best uh, position in the uh, Vuelta for uh, Vermisha. Uh, riding uh, strongly in the uh, Tour of Switzerland was Os Os, uh, uh, his best position, a top nine on uh, stage number two. This is where they're going to be heading. They're going to be making their way back in to the sides of the city. This amazing uh, venue for the end. Now, the, uh, there's some serious uh, heights. So, uh, 40 metres of elevation, in fact, at, uh, of those uh, walls. So, uh, massive trench in there, 40 metre deep trench. You've got the walls on top of that. And uh, it's uh, certainly... Uh, Serious stuff, 46, 52 feet tall, each of those uh, walls. And uh, they're actually about uh, two and a half, 2.1 meters. I think that's uh, going to be uh, six, uh, six foot nine, uh, the uh, distance between them. Now, you can see a riders being lapped by our race leader. Always an interesting moment. And the riders are coming through. So they're a full lap ahead here as they come in. Uh, around the circuit. They're now on the run in that they did as part of their run to the Citadella for the first time. So if you remember that, we have a tarmac section. We then move in around through the farm fields. We then move from that in towards the edge. And this is where things get interesting. Look at the size of the group these two are going to be catching here today. So the motorbike will be uh, trying to bring them in and uh, through. The riders know the race leaders are coming on here. The uh, motorbikes, Oss and uh, Vermisha, they've got the breath, will shout leaders on the way through. I just hope they don't take a look quite as close at the tarmac as our camera was then because uh, they've got to get round in one piece and head back in to town once again. So here we go, our two leaders come out, uh, heading back on to the farm tracks that will bring them uh, down to the uh, rivers and along the side uh, that bypass and then heading into that single track section before they reappear on the roads and head in to the defences. Now the wind today blowing from the northeast. That's from the rider's right hand shoulder here. Both riders on that right hand side. And uh, I think it is the smoother line. We saw the rider's preference being there last time through as well. 
certainly looks like it's fractionally smooth. They're cutting the corner here just to uh, save a little bit of distance. Be interesting to see if they hop back over to the uh, right hand side of the state of this left hand side. They are going to take the right hand turn on the bridge. It would give them a wider line and stay into the left hand side. So these two have now got to surely believe that they are going to be sharing the gold and the silver medals between them. They're back out at nearly five minutes here today. Look at Vermeesh into the grass to take the wide line in to try and carry a little bit more pace. Is he just practicing that line for later? Oswald won't have seen him do that. He may have heard that, but he certainly won't have seen it even out the corner of his eye. And is Vermeesh doing the smart thing that you see cyclocross riders doing? Only practicing lines when they're behind other riders where the other rider can't see the line that they're taking. Certainly Vermeesh, one of the regulars who we know has got some serious time on the cross bike. He's got some very good skills that will help him when we go around those tight turns. The other thing that will help on the tight turns on the the ramparts on the descent and the tight right and then that right and climb is that they are very similar to a cross turn that you see on cyclocross and Vermeesh is a smaller rider. Now the wheelbase of the bike, the length of the bike will affect how that handles as does the head angle of the bike so the angle that the forks and the front wheel stick out in front. Generally a gravel bike is slightly more slacker angled than a cyclocross bike. It doesn't turn quite as quick, it's more stable and it's more comfortable, which means that you get less fatigue. However, the smaller rider has the advantage that his centre of gravity is also going to be lower. He's going to be able to push around that corner and should be able to corner quicker. Not always the case. There are some very tall riders who have some incredible skills when it comes to descending. They don't all need to be as diminutive as uh, Tom Peacock and uh, a uh, rider whose uh, skin suit is actually hung on my wall, actually, in the studio here. And uh, generally, uh, in fact, uh, I think his skin suit is probably not actually the same size as uh, my torso on its own, his uh, entire skin. So he is that small. Uh, uh, some of the bigger riders can uh, corner just as well. But who's tired? Who's got... Uh, the ability to keep the pace. Interesting to see aero bar there on uh, the uh, bike of Vermeesh, the aerofoil section cutting through the wind, that little bit easier, and the handlebar there of uh, Os. So just uh, going along a side, our state side rider, that's going to be one of our age group riders. All of the riders, the pros and the amateurs, setting off, they're all uh, on the course on the same day and uh, the age group for, with the uh, high numbers and the uh, green number on the side they're denoting their age group and it does mean the riders have to be adept at going around other riders so if you're used to riding a crit or overtaking then you're going to find it easier if you know how to handle by getting bumped and barged with other riders that's going to help if you do get tangled up hopefully all of the lap riders will move out of the way you just hear the uh, wind blowing across our uh, bike at the moment and uh, it certainly shows the riders again hugging that right-hand side once again. There's going to be more shelter from the wind as it blows over the top of the buildings, as it blows over those hedgerows, it'll swirl around. If you stay tight underneath the uh, buildings, you've less chance of getting caught in that, but you're still subjected to it as you go past each of these entranceways. So less than 30k to go here at the uh, Men's Elite uh, the World Gravel Championships uh, for 2022 are two race leaders, Gianni Vermeesh from Belgium, Daniel Oss from Italy. In that order on the road, on your screens in front of you with a four minute, 44 second lead over a chasing pack that has started to fracture behind, but is plagued with indecision and in action, not picking up the pace, not closing down leaders and no concerted chase. All that seems to be happening in that group at the back is when they come into a technical section, the smart riders, those with the power and the pace to enforce the will at the front. They are breaking the group just by applying the pressure and hoping that something goes wrong behind, which it is. We've seen riders with drop chains, with uh, issues with the uh, transmission. We've seen riders on the floor as that big pack tries to negotiate its way around this final finishing circuit. But at the moment, it's Os leading in towards the side of the ramparts. They can see on their left-hand side the course. They're going to be on the other side of that moat. They're going to be around the side of the defences. They take a left-hand turn onto the bridge. This is where Vermeesh, the last time around, took a super wide line. 
You see him again, no, not quite going quite as wide this time. Clearly getting some practice in. Always oh, up there thinking, making sure that he's practicing, knows what's underneath his wheels goes around, and then taking that right hand turn here. So down they go. This is that uh, long run. They're going to take the right hand fork, it will drop down, and then we're going to see a kick out now. 20. 9k just under 29k at the moment you can just see the shot from our helicopter here looking down on these riders around the hedgerow they go both riders with the right foot out as they come around that turn the motorbike having to take the wider line and they've got to get this right as they come down past the uh, vines the uh, commissaire bike the race referees with the uh, red tabas on there right alongside the riders along with the guys and look at this they're using that's a rubber crumb surface of the uh, Equipment at the side, the physical equipment at the side. They're 1k off finishing at this their penultimate lap. The rider still with the ability to pick their line, to pick where they go, to minimise that resistance, to shorten the distance through. And at the moment, absolutely fine. I think we've got radio tour down in there. You can see the quad bike rattling his way across the surface, even down here at the side of the moat. It is not smooth by any stretch of the imagination. You can see the walkway up to the right part of the uh, repairs are done and the restoration to this amazing uh, site here today. So you can see uh, lots of shouts, lots of encouragement down at the uh, side of the course and uh, I suspect uh, going to be uh, giving uh, plenty of encouragement to the riders going through. You can just see two leaders now. Oss is the bigger of the two with the darker blue jersey. He's uh, just pushing on to the front. They're going to come into that tight right, which brings them back up where the spectators are above them. This is where it tightens. You'll see the barriers coming, an indication that they're going to do that 180-degree turn. Here we go. They're going to come in now. The uh, quad bike is holding back that uh, group of uh, riders behind. And the reason it's doing that is because they are riders who are lapped. They're not in the same point. And behind these riders, as they come up here with us accelerating up, you can see the carnage behind us. The motorbike and the quad bike try and go round. There's a reason they sit back from the race leaders here. So here we go. In they come. Final 250 metres of this a lap. Next time they come here, they'll be doing this for the final. This is their dress rehearsal. And you can see they're going to be catching more of those age group riders as they come through. So one lap to go for the race leaders. The rider in the blue, Daniel Austin, that dark blue, flicks the elbow for the light of blue clad, that traditional Belgian strip with Gianni Vermeesh up on the front of the uh, duo as they go in and uh, through the uh, line that time around. And uh, we're going to try and get a uh, time check as it comes through. Remember, we only have 27 kilometers uh, to uh, go at the uh, moment. 27.4 kilometers to go in to the uh, finish. And uh, at the moment, you can see these riders are absolutely flying. They're not losing any time that we saw up to this point. The chase is behind, but they're five minutes behind. That puts them right in the middle of that next technical section. They're going to be fighting it out on the way in to the finish. And hopefully we're going to get to see those chasers going down into the banking as our two leaders. This is the fight for the gold and the silver medal. It's the fight for the world champions jersey, the iconic white jersey with the rainbow stripes. These riders looking to take away the first of those in the gravel discipline here in Veneto, in the walls of the Citadella in 2022. So more food, more drink being put on board by our riders. They used to long days in the uh, saddle on the bigger tours. They uh, know how to fuel themselves up. And uh, really interesting uh, to see. You've got two of the uh, real characters of the Aperta, Daniel Oss and Gianni Vermeesh, with uh, real different backgrounds in their riding as well. But uh, Oss, the taller figure, Figure of the two, and then you've got Vermeer, the uh, slightly short feeds coming in, and we're going to take the uh, right hand turn off this uh, avenue. And now starting to head back out of town once again. So our race leaders clear of town, clear of the uh, Citadella. At the moment, that gap is looking good. Now here come the uh, chasing pack. 
on the way round. And uh, I'm just going to double check you on my motorbike uh, indicating it is the lead pack. They're going to take the right hand turn onto the uh, dusty section. It will drop them down. Now, if you thought our two leaders had it hard coming up on lateral riders, it's going to be even more interesting. This is one of the things about girl. Everybody's out on the course at the same time. There has been a split with our women's racing yesterday and our men's today, but you're still going to find other riders. You're going to come up on riders who've been lapped or on different distance riders. Remember, things like Unbound Gravel go right up the extra large, the XL. Uh, that is uh, going to be 350 miles or what is 563k. Now, the push of this chasing group is coming. They are starting to wind this up and it's starting to fracture. We'll get a better indicator when they come in over the line next time. So on to the climb they go. Really interesting to see. We've got a real mix up on the front. And that looks to me like that is uh, going to uh, be a Van Arbermatt. I think going around that turn, they're just going to get a double check. Has come in to a Worthy uh, uh, line. He's just having a little look uh, down in there. Matthew Van Der Poel definitely in uh, the mix at the moment. Now, this is uh, really interesting to see. Look at this, uh, Kurt Nielsen after those early attacks, he's still in there, but it's gonna be Van der Poel who's gonna lead them over the line in third position. So coming in over the uh, line, it was Vermeesh and Oss. They had a uh, decent uh, gap. It was still holding at uh, just under five minutes at the uh, line. Van der Poel, Van Arbemart, Ballerini in that chasing group. Cut Nielsen, DeMarkey, Nielsen in the group chasing only four seconds back. And it's Stieber. You're talking about Peter Sagan being down maybe only 15 seconds as they came in through that uh, line. And you can see the pushes on. They are chasing hard at the moment, but they are really going to have to fight to get back in touch with the battle, even for bronze medal at the moment. Star so leaders are coming in through. They're going to be led in and over the line. And Lillian Camajan, I think the rider from France who had that problem in the field on that right hand cut across the field edge there. He's uh, got company in uh, this group. Looks like Nathan Haas in here. Haas in uh, the uh, group of uh, riders that's in behind going down that straight and underneath the uh, finish line for the penultimate time. Next time round, it will be that final lap. However, uh, yeah, riders are well out on the circuit. So a quick round of us that came through with one lap to go. Gianni Vermeesh and Daniel Oss came through four hours, 27 minutes, 41 seconds on the clock. Matthew van der Poel led across the chasing group, four minutes, 31, sorry, four hours, 31 minutes, 22 seconds in the uh, deficit. With him, Van Arbemart, Ballerini, Court Nielsen, DeMarkey, Nielsen, Tario, Stiebar, three seconds off the pace, Schromberger, four seconds off the uh, wheel of van der Poel. And uh, as these riders have continued onwards, uh, you can just see the gaps have opened up with Sagan, Kamaja being distanced, Beers, Haas, uh, Quintanilla being distanced, Pritzen again uh, being a distance from the pack. And this uh, chasing the group here, surely this is where we are going to see that uh, bronze medal come from, this uh, select group. So Di Marchi uh, moves out of the way, going round his side goes Ballerini. Then immediately next to him, Van Arbemart takes his turn. Then it's going to be Van der Poel, followed by Court Nielsen. I think uh, going through a double check uh, from the uh, numbers, just trying to keep uh, uh, check for all of the Danish riders in at this uh, group. Nielsen doing a great uh, ride here as uh, well, but certainly looking at, to me like uh, we are going to uh, see some uh, serious uh, pace going on as they go in because they won't want to be in trouble. So here we go. It is uh, Court Nielsen and Dimarki in there. So uh, you can just uh, see that pack looking uh, good. Who is going to take this out of this group? At the moment, it looks like it's going to be a bronze medal. The gap is down to 3.37 now 
from our latest time check. The Italians are doing the work. So Ballerini and De Marchi on the front doing the work. Meanwhile, their teammate, Os, at the front of the race here with Vermeesh on his heels from Belgium. So in uh, to the the uh, lanes they go. You can just see the width of the asphalt at the time that comes down. You start to see grass growing out in the middle. This is a real mat track. This is the family name for anything that should be ridden on a gravel bike or a mountain bike, but you go down on any bike you've got with you. And at the moment, this is a proper mat track. It's a really rough. It goes to single track. You've got grass in the middle. You can see there are holes all over the place, overhanging trees. And it is definitely going to be interesting to see which of these two wants to take this the most. Time is running out for them to make any kind of breakaway and to make it stick. But equally, they're not going to want to go too soon because they're not going to want to run out of energy from the other end. Meanwhile, five chases now. Well, we did have 50, we we're right the way down here. We've got Loman, Nielsen, Van der Poel, Ballerini, Court Nielsen and Di Marchi in this group. Come to our screen at the moment. So just uh, taking a check, I think uh, Ballerini is in there. Uh, David Ballerini, a uh, second from the back on the left-hand side of there. Cotton Nielsen with uh, number 74 on his back with those big, uh, long uh, pink socks on. Uh, just tucked on the back of the group. You see uh, Matthew van der Poel in the uh, Netherlands, uh, that light orange just uh, peeking through the uh, white overlay on a top. Taking it in turns as they come in through here, just uh, watching these riders uh, move in and out of the way. Craig van Arbemart, the uh, Belgian rider, now comes to the back on the left-hand side. So they're still taking turns as they come through. So van Arbemart at the back, van der Poel on the front, leading them around these turns. A select group of six chasers left, chasing our two leaders on your screen at the moment. And you can see that transition. Oh, that's horrible. Just on the apex of a turn, a, a real a deep hole with a sharp edge onto the asphalt and a lot of debris spilling out onto the asphalt there. And that makes it tricky when you're moving at pace. Now onto the gravel. You can just see there, Vermeesh quickly off to the right-hand side, not wanting to stay on there. The bike reeling around underneath him. And this is one of the differences. Generally on the mountain bike, you've got it planted. You know where you're going on it. It's going to stay where you want it to go. When you're riding a cyclocross bike, that is going to wriggle about all the time if it's muddy and it's going to move where it wants. You kind of just let it do what it wants to do. When you're riding a gravel bike, a bit different again because generally you've got more tread on the sides, but you've got a smoother central section, which is faster on the sections of asphalt, particularly today where you're looking for absolute speed in there. So that means that when you go onto the slippery stuff, if you're too upright, you've got no grip. If you lean it over, you're going to have a lot more grip. So knowing how that bike handles and where you're comfortable with what that bike is doing underneath you is going to be key. They've had a long way to find that out, 175 kilometers, well over 100 and odd miles now. But this is when it matters the most now. This chasing a group come onto that same section here, making the way in the three. You just see the motorbike going over that bumpy section. And the six riders pushing on here, just taking a little bit of a look at the front. It looks to me like uh, we've got our Italian rider on the front, going to lead them in uh, to this uh, left hand, right hand chicane. And it's an Italian rider on the front of the race. 20 kilometers coming up to go. Three minutes is the lead. The gap is coming down. It's coming down by more as the race comes into its conclusion. If I was a betting man, dangerous thing for me to do watching as much bike racing as I do. I would still say that the money should be going on these two to take the win. They're not going to give up three minutes very easily in 20, less than 20 kilometers to go. But there's some serious firepower behind. They've been in the group. They'll have had more rest. These two have been sharing the work equally between them in that chasing a group of seven riders behind. I think we are going to find uh, at least one or two have been doing some very smart uh, riding and sheltering from the wind. And uh, I think if this was... Uh, uh, a race where we could see what power they were putting out, what was per kilo, what was they were putting out over the duration of the race. It would be well down for some of these riders where they've ridden smart. Now, out uh, from this road, they take the right-hand turn. This is that tricky exit with the uh, pothole just on the entranceway. 
all seven uh, negotiating uh, that cleanly and uh, coming through uh, clear of uh, the uh, pack now onto the gravel. Now, this is where we saw it get really tricky. It looks to me like Van der Poel leads them in this time. Already one of the Italians, I think, just going out to the right-hand side there. I think uh, as they came in and over, and it's starting to break up. And I think Van Albemarck now pushing up onto the front. There's an attack gone off the front. Now, I think that's going to be Van Albemarck who's gone clear of the uh, group. We've seen him go and ride off to a victory before. He's an absolutely class act. Van der Poel is still leading the uh, main pack of that. It's a group by the look of it. We're going to try and get our helicopter in as close as we dare here today to go up and over the uh, jumps at the side there. But we're taking a look at down. The chase is on behind. And that looks to me like that is Van Albemarck who's gone. He's gone on the offensive now. This is going to be really uh, difficult for our cameras to get up there with them. There's so many riders who've been lapped on the way through in the way. It'll make life very difficult. Our camera at the moment here stuck up behind uh, Peter Sagan, who is off the pace. You can see how far down uh, Sagan is here at the moment. He's just coming out on uh, to that tarmac section before the next the left-hand turn. He's not going to be in the fight here today. He came here to ride it. He didn't know what to expect. I think he uh, has... Uh, I'm hoping he's enjoyed his day out somewhere along the uh, lines. It's always very difficult to tell with our professional riders. A great quote from uh, Chris Borman about whether he actually enjoyed riding his bike very much when he was a professional. Well, I think you've got to love it really somewhere deep at heart. Uh, to be pushing on at the moment. The front of this group continuing to push here. You can see that is Greg Van Arbemont leading this pack through at the moment. So Van Arbemont leading, just taking a little bit of a look down into that leading group, just trying to uh, see who might have managed to get into the mix. I suspect that uh, we have uh, got uh, a uh, one or two riders uh, maybe hitching a ride in there. You never know. It is possible, but that could well be Stieber, who's made his way up into uh, that group that's been missed on the uh, way through. Just going to try and get the uh, camera down in uh, to the uh, group as they came through. I think that is uh, going to be Stieber from the uh, Czech Republic in there. If that is Stieber, that is some ride by him to uh, come across to the leading chases. We're going to try and get that uh, confirmed down there. But at the moment, this group coming back up pretty much together again. They're down to six riders are chases. They're 256 down. So it's less than three minutes. Van der Poel in here. Caught Nielsen in here. We've got, uh, got Ballerini in. We've also got Marky in this uh, group. It looks like it is one of the Danes who has been ejected. And that uh, could well be uh, Nielsen rather than Court. Nielsen depends on uh, why they went on the way through. So here we go. Just in with that chasing group. Van Arbema on the back of this pack. Coming around. It looks to me, that looks to me like the uh, Star Steve. We're going to have a better look hopefully in a uh, second when the uh, bikes get up there with them. That's uh, a very distinctive uh, style. If he pulls a whip over one of the uh, drainage ditches, you'll know it, Stevie. That's the sort of uh, rider he is. Uh, very much, uh, very similar rider, very much in style uh, like uh, Matthew van der Poel, right, who enjoys riding his bike out. So look at, down at our chases. Our leaders at 17k to go. This group just under three minutes behind the leading group. So I think a lot of looks behind. I think they're waiting for the next big move. Will he go on the road or will somebody push on on the off-road section? And look at this. We've seen another rider coming across. This time around, I think that's going to be Fedorov of Kazakhstan making uh, the uh, junction. So uh, Fedorov uh, jumping across from the uh, group behind. So there we are, up on to the hills up on the screen it comes. So uh, he's made the junction, and this is really interesting now. The group have backed off the pace. They're not working as hard as maybe they should have done, and they've been joined because that was a group of seven riders. It is now coalescing into a bigger group, and that is going to be really telling. A lap rider just being overtaken there. You can see the difference in pace here between the uh, top flight riders in the elite race and more riders coming up behind. So 
this could regroup before the finish. We could well see another mass sprint into the uh, technical sections on the ramparts. But this absolutely absorbing at the moment. It breaks apart. It comes together. It breaks apart again. So back to our leaders. Uh, Johnny Vermeesh and Daniel Oss left to right on your screen. 16 kilometres left to go. 10 miles heading in almost exactly to the race finish. And at the moment, that gap now down to 2 minutes 47. The riders have been out there. They've pushed on late on in uh, the uh, hills into the uh, flatter sections and... Uh, you could see that uh, with 110k to go, just over 70 miles to go, and the uh, road is going clear. Johnny Vermish and uh, Daniel Arsley opened up a gap that was well over five minutes at one point. It's been brought down as we come into our laps of the Citadel, but uh, not coming down, I think, quick enough for these riders to play a, a real part in the finale in terms of a gold or silver medal position. However, there's still a bronze medal of a first stake. They could pull back that leading uh, duo if they work together. But we're not seeing that. We're seeing attacks. We're seeing a squeeze on at the front from the riders who are strong. Then a recovery. You've just seen uh, Matthew Van Der Poel at the back there just trying to uh, get a little bit of recovery done before he pushes once again. The stronger riders will go to the front. Those with the skills uh, when they hit the technical sections before they come back into town, into the Citadel. And the uh, Citadel here, you can see laid out before you. Our riders join on the uh, bridge centre screen. They head across to the uh, right. They drop it back uh, down around, go underneath the uh, bridge, and then head around in a clockwise direction before working the way back up and coming back in through the gates to go from left to right on your screen in and through the uh, roads here in the uh, Citadel. Well, they a quarter the centre of a town here and the Citadel gateways. Well, they are on the four points of the compass almost exactly well. Who's going to be centre of that compass? Who is going to be centre stage on our world championship podium here in Veneto in the Citadel in the northeast of Italy, the very first men's world elite title going to be going to, I think, one of these two riders. Less than 15 kilometres to go. We can all ride 10 miles, can't we? Surely. Can we ride it this fast? No, not a chance. These two have done an amazing job so far. They've kept the pace high. They attacked early. They believed they went for it, and they stayed clear as our chasers catch more lapped riders on the way through. So that's a race clock still hovering just underneath three minutes. The chasing pack uh, going to make the way out. And I think uh, our camera bike are waiting for some clear roads down there. I'm going to get many of those uh, today. It's full of riders. It's full of spectators. It's full of the uh, teams as well, of course, as our amazing uh, competitors who are at the very front of the race here today in Veneto. You can see the hills in the distance. We started off in Vicenza. We've made our way down to Padua, come back up, heading through up the Brenta River in to the side of the Citadel. And we are now into our final lap, the 27K laps, two laps that make up the final section. This is where we saw those problems. You can see all of the bike tracks going through. This time around, they do cut the corner and all of the tracks, and uh, you can just imagine what was happening in that uh, chasing group. We didn't see them go into that muddy section, but they'll have come charging in, and uh, somebody is going to have gone straight over the bars of the front wheel dug in there. It's something we've all done at some point or another on the bike. If you ride it off-road, the one thing you can guarantee is going to have an off, and uh, even listening uh, to uh, riders uh, John Bosselman uh, in his uh, ride, uh, when he was out and uh, racing, uh, even when uh, he was in there uh, taking uh, great positions in uh, things like unbound, you know, putting your foot down, I came off three times on the way through, I think he said. Uh, and uh, riders do come off, it is just part of it. The longer it goes, the more technical it gets, the more likely you are to come off. And uh, it is unfortunately or fortunately all part of the game. The key is not to do it at an important moment while well, doing it there meant that you miss that uh, split in the uh, chasing a group. At the moment, though, our two leaders, no chance of a split between them. 
Os to the right hand side now in what is a dangerous position we're coming in at 13k to go Vermish is hovering behind here a little bit and uh, I wonder if one of these all-rounders is going to put uh, an attack in. Remember, if you sprint out, you're going to put in an effort. You're going to maybe go clear. It's going to do two things. It's maybe going to give you the gap, but it's also going to say, right, the truce is over. We're not working together anymore. It's every man for themselves. And that point is likely to come before we hit the final sprint. It's likely to come as these runners come in to the citadel at walls they won't want to do it where there is a chance for the other riders to come back they will want to have a clean line around those technical features no one will want to go in to the banks of the ramparts into those tight right hand turns in second wheel on the wheel of somebody else they'll want to be in on front wheel but we can see positions change in that sprint if they are together dependent on the power and the sprinting prowess of those riders I don't think would you want to gamble in yourself. You've ridden all this. You're in with a chance. You can either take what is known as first loser or the silver medal, or you can be the winner and take away the world championship. Not everybody's going to want that championship. Well, over the fields, the uh, farmers go. I'm not sure I want to be eating whatever's coming out of the crops on the uh, corner of that field. Uh, the riders here chasing the uh, front of the race are really putting the pressure on. And I think we've seen yet more breaking in the uh, chasing group behind our cameras. Unable to uh, get up close and personal at this stage, but you can see how strung out this group is. It reformed, but it has a split uh, once again. So, uh, and the uh, guys asking what the gap is, is the same way, it's the same guys. It's just the same, and that's exactly what uh, so the, the, the riders are looking for. They're looking to know, have we caught, have we distanced, are we getting pulled back? At what point do we make that decision? They've both just got that same information. Well, you can see the shouts there, one of the age group riders getting the support of his countrymen there. So uh, now these two riders surely must know, with 12 kilometers to go, this has got to come down to this last few K. And they've got to be thinking more about taking the win now than they are about what's behind them. They've been there, they've seen there, they've done that, they got the T-shirt. There's only one shirt they want now. That is the World Champions shirt, the one that comes with the rainbow stripes on it. Over 30 miles now coming out of these roads, just under 30, in fact. Uh, if I get my uh, maths correct, as they go through at 51, 52 kilometers an hour, Daniel Oss on the front, he's pushing around a pretty big gear there. It's uh, still looking super smooth. No body rock from these two. They spent far too much time on the bike. When a rider gets tired, their shoulders start to rock, they start to move about. Jennifer Meese just getting out of the saddle there. One thing these riders won't be so used to is uh, the vibration coming through. Uh, Matthew Van Poel going for a flight boost saddle, one with a uh, slightly more cushioning on it. Uh, a number of the uh, riders uh, riding bikes that uh, have rubber bumper shock absorbers in there, uh, whether that's on the handlebars or in uh, to the uh, seat tube. Now, just uh, taking a look down at our chasing group here, and it uh, looks to me like the gap has opened up. It looks like it's Van der Poel on the front. Van Arbermark sitting in second wheel. And third wheel at the moment is Alessandro De Marchi. So De Marchi at the moment is the rider who has managed to go with Van Arbermark and Van der Poel. So two Italian riders, two Belgian riders, and one Dutchman in our leading five riders. Sandro De Marchi, Matthew van der Poel, and Greg van Arbermart. What a uh, triumvirate of talent. Uh, what a trio of riders. And they are coming up on a group here who I think are pretty oblivious to the fact that the uh, race uh, the lead has gone through and the chases are on their way. They'll know the figure of uh, van der Poel. They've probably seen him too. And the shout came out there, get over. You could hear it coming through. You know, as you come up to a group, you're looking to take some draft. He was tight on them there but then a rider just drifted off the front of the big pack and I think uh, there's going to be a uh, that was a close one moment there so uh, Van der Poel moves off to one side 231 is the gap to our chasers behind they're starting to make ground but not fast enough Van Abema on that brand new gravel bike there from BMC 
Uh, you got bike that has all already been uh, seeing uh, some fantastic action yesterday. You can see uh, the uh, canyon there of uh, Vanderpol. Then it's going to be the earlier bike of uh, Demarkey going through. All the riders on deep carbon rims, all on uh, disc wheels, as you would expect. A lot of the riders are rolling on 32 millimeter tires rather than going right out to a proper full on gravel 45 50 mil tire just simply to get the pace and speed that they require on these faster sections prepared to take the risk of a higher risk of impact puncture of damage the riders popping up on to the banking that was one of the reasons that the leaders wanted to get through that's the bank where you dropped off the roadway up onto the bank on the right-hand side. We saw spectators crossing just in front of our leaders first time round. The leading riders in the race already clear of this section. The chase is on behind Demarkey at the moment. Not quite on the heels of the two in front. It's Van der Poel, then it's Van Arbema, and then it's Demarkey in that chasing group at the moment. So here's where we have less than 10 kilometers, just over six miles to go in the race. You can just see the chase is being led by Matthew van der Poel, leading the chase or one of the most prolific winners, a talented rider who's taken world championship titles in a multitude of uh, different disciplines as well as being a rider who can win on pretty much any terrain. At the moment, the chasing group are giving away just over two minutes. It has come down from five minutes from our leaders, but it's still two minutes from the chasing group on your screens at the moment to our two race leaders, Daniel Oss and Gianni Vermeesh, who broke a clear nearly uh, 100 miles ago. Uh, now uh, looking like they could well seal a victory for one of them with that gap. It's now down to less than two minutes, but time is running out with nine kilometers left to go, including the drop down to the moat, the climb up the ramparts and the run in uh, through those couples in to the finish. We've got a lot of single track on the way in before that. And uh, just looking at the pace of the uh, riders behind, I think those three riders have now been caught. Just uh, taking a look down, confirmation for me, really coming from those two Danish riders behind. And it's Nielsen and uh, going to be uh, the uh, rider there, uh, caught uh, Nielsen uh, with him. So I think that's our two Danish riders coming back up. And if that is the case, I think they have probably brought uh, Rebelin back up as uh, uh, Sorry, David uh, Ballerini uh, back up into that uh, group as well as they came in and through. And uh, I think uh, this group could come back together as we come into town. Remember, we've got a couple of tarmac sections to allow a little bit of easing and a regroup. A lot easier when you're in the wheels or when you are on the tarmac at the moment, though. Interesting to see those riders, that little bit of a dip off the uh, banking. The uh, motorbike that's tracking our riders just having to pull up to one side there as these riders go through. The riders picking their own line up on the flood defences alongside a citadel here. But uh, town is not all that far away as our camera tries to track our riders in uh, through. So the chasers, two minutes behind, 8K for our race leaders. And this is where they're aiming for, the center of that circle. This is where they want to be. They all want to come in to the Citadella in that race. They all want to be the rider who can get in there first. Who will it be? Who will come in to the center leading out the race? Well, not long to find out here at the 2022 Gravel World Championships here in Veneto in Italy, the UCI World Championships in a part of a long run of championships. We've had our mountain bike XCO, the XCC, we've had the XCE and the XCM, all lots of uh, letters, but essentially from the shortest, the XCE, which is a race of about a minute and a half to two, right the way to the mountain marathons, which is several hours and everything in between. We've also, of course, had races like the road championships over in Wollongong in Australia. Great to see that in action. We're now at the gravel championships. Don't forget, of course, we have the World Track Championships coming up next week. 
And we've got to wait a little bit longer for the cyclocross championships. They are going to be coming up at uh, the uh, end of uh, January into the new year. But at the moment, our riders making the way back in. We wait for our cameras to pick up our race at leaders. They're not going to be all that far away. This, the final turn that will bring them up onto the climb. So lots of riders taking that climb in lots of different ways and a variety of speeds. That could well be the critical corner on this course, the right-hand turn from the moat on to the banking, the critical point at which either Daniel Oss or Gianni Vermeesh are able to secure the World Championship. I'm sure they won't want to leave it to a sprint, but it may well go that way. This is our chasing group. The last time a check we got this was still hovering at the two minute marker and it has once again reformed here so the group has come back uh, together again We've got ballerini in here we have uh, caught nielsen in the group you've got uh, van abermont working well in the uh, pack uh, but at the front of the race gianni vermish at the moment now our cameras come back uh, to the head of the race we're looking for daniel Oss. To see what has happened to us. Is he on the wheel of Vermish? Vermish is working very, very hard here at the moment. He's took down. I'm looking for the shadow of us, and has us gone out of our sight at the moment? The front of the race, we're focused on one rider. We've got less than 6k to go. And it's looking to me like uh, there's been problems uh, for us. We look to see if we can see with the side of the road. No news coming in on our cameras or on uh, race radio, in fact, at the moment. But at the front of the race, Gianni Vermeesh has a uh, broken clear. He's on his own, and it could well be he's looking to solo in to the uh, finish here today. So this is an interesting development here in the uh, racing. And there's going to be all sorts of tales told when we come in uh, to the finish because Vermeesh has gone hard. We're trying to take a little bit of a look at, to see where we're at. We're on 5K to go. Thank you very much to our cameraman there. Doing a great job out on the course, trying to get as many pictures from this really tough uh, race route out at the World Championships. It is a journey for Mish. Well, I thought he might have the better sprint on him. I don't think he's going to need it. He's now heading up for three and a half miles, just under three and a half miles to the finish of 4.9K two minutes back to the main chasing group the rider that is an unknown out there it is the italian rider daniel os who is with him from the early move in this breakaway and os is not in this group now our cameras were trying to track both riders all the way in to the finish but obviously we're subject to getting those pictures in and out and the problem has gone that we don't know where os is I'm not sure that Mish knows exactly where he is at the moment because uh, he's absolutely giving it everything. 5K is always one of those key markers in your head. It's so natural to count down in uh, units of five in ten. You're brought up to do it and you know when you're at 5K to go, you know you can give it everything. You're not going to blow up between there and the finish. You can give it everything, a really big effort now and just uh, push all the way in. And it's Vermeesh, the uh, Belgian, who is uh, riding on at the moment. A rider who uh, we are no doubt expecting to see in action in some of the uh, cross. Well, he'd love to go race off road knowing that he is the uh, gravel world champion for 2022. At the moment, though, he's got to now just go for this. He's put his effort in, he's gone clear. He is holding the front of the race. He's uh, taking a little bit of a wide line there. He looks over his right hand shoulder. Look at him peering over the bridge. He's looking to try and see where Oss is. I think our camera is pretty much trying to do the same thing here without giving the rider any assistance. It can't go in front of him and create draft for the rider to go into. We hit 4K to go. They are counting down quickly here. And uh, as you go around some really big loose stones on the edge of that corner, 
No problems for the Mish here. So we are now less than 4K to the finish, but Mish has a gap from the main chasing group, still holding at two minutes. Daniel Oss, we've no idea where he is. He has uh, disappeared from our shots. Our camera up in the air. The helicopter may be able to get a better shot. This isn't police action, Cameron. This is uh, the World uh, Championships. This is the race that's on, but a bit like uh, you see those uh, tracking shots trying to chase down fugitives at the moment. We are trying to track down Daniel Oss out on the uh, course. The Mish is looking like he's got this sewn up at the moment, and I can see no sign on our camera shots at the moment of uh, Daniel Oss. There's nothing coming through on any of the communications at the moment. What has happened to Oss out on the uh, course? It's going to be interesting to see at the end of this race or what's happening. I feel sorry for us at the moment. Let's see if we get a track back in, in any of our cameras to see what happened to him. So here we go. It is a less than uh, 3K very shortly. 3K coming up at four or right at less than two minutes on there. Here we go. There we are. 3K aboard goes through. And Vermish is giving it everything. He's not taking too many looks back behind. He must have been pretty convinced as he looked over his shoulder as he came in around over the uh, bridge, over the uh, dual carriageway, over that uh, twin section of bypass around the uh, town, that he had sufficient uh, gap to be able to open up and continue onwards. So Vermish leading out the Belgian here is going to make history. If he can come in solo, he's going to have plenty of time to celebrate. It also means if he's got enough of a gap, he's going to be able to uh, take his time. We're looking behind for us. There's no sign in the distance behind us. And at the moment, I think of Vermish is starting to think this is going to be his day at the office. It's going to be his day to pull on the jersey. He takes a little look behind. He's just trying to look in between the motorbikes. Well, sometimes when they give you assistance, when you can find out time checks from him at the moment, he's trying to look between them to see where Oss is, if Oss is coming. Now, if it was a slight mistake, if Oss was distanced because of an attack by Vermeesh, Oss would have tried to respond to that. He would have tried to get going quickly. But with the gap opening up, either Oss's socks have well and truly got blown off him, or he is going to be in big problems mechanically-wise because that gap had really opened up. Oh, so we are able to follow our riders there. The gap has got blown in to smithereens at the moment. So here we go. Look at that. Vermisha signaling to the bikes there. Have I got it? Have I got it? What's the time gap? Well, now is the time they're going to track him. That camera bike glued to the back wheel. I'm not surprised as they come in through. More lapped riders being passed on the way in. Don't worry, there's nobody in front of this man. It is Gianni Vermish heading up here and uh, making his way in to town. Remember, he gets to the defences and takes a right-hand turn. So I think that was 50 seconds to Oss uh, at the moment. So uh, that's just coming from our motorbike crew. It's 150 to the main pack. Here is Oss now. I'm just looking to see if there's any damage to him or his bike at the moment. He's looking to me, he's looking tight. He's uh, certainly pushing a big gear around here, but Voss has uh, been a distance. No sign of those wheels bouncing on the rims. And Oss now is the uh, chaser, the sole chaser behind our race leader. Here he comes, it's Gianni Vermish. He's got a big enough gap surely now to take this out. He can take his time, he can pick his line. He can be careful when he comes up to back markers. Our cameras are smacking into the trees as we come down here. The cameraman wants to be right on the wheel of Gianni Vermish. He comes round this turn. Our camera bike just can't make that corner as tight as these uh, cyclists can coming around that turn. He doesn't need to help it, but look at this. The pressure is on. Is he going to start to use that rubber club section as well? Well, he has used that on the first time and the second now. He stays on that hard-packed surface at the bottom. He's got 1K to go. 1,000 metres to go to the finish here. Above him is Oss, and Oss surely must know now that his chance of taking a gold medal rests on a major mistake. A massive mechanical is going to have to happen, and I think Oss is tired. Look at him locking up the bike on the way down there as he came down that descent. 
That is a sign that he's uh, not going to get back for me. He's not got the strength. He's not got the pace. So the time check comes up. 27 seconds between the rider on your screens, Gianni Vermeesh and Daniel Oss behind him. And then just over a minute and a half across them back to the big group of chasers who are fighting it out for third place and the bronze medal here at the UCI 2022 Gravel World Championships in Veneto. The right-hand turn is done. No mistakes by Vermeesh. The motorbikes will try and get around this as quick as they can. They know that they've got Daniel Oss chasing hard behind, but Vermeesh now is on to the tarmac. He's going to come down alongside the spectators. He's going to take the left-hand turn. 300 more meters to go. What is he feeling now? It's got to be pure elation because he knows that there's no way he's going to get robbed of the very first men's elite title. He punches the air. 200 meters to celebrate now. He looks over his shoulder. The professional touch. Belgium are going to take the first UCI a men's elite a world gravel championships here in Benito. Gianni Vermeesh takes it away he comes in and across the line what a ride the long breakaway paid off and Gianni Vermeesh is the world champion as he comes in through the line it's going to be a silver medal it will be scant consolation for his long time comrade in arms the man who tracks all the way in and it was only in those last few kilometers that Daniel lost was distance. It's going to be a medal. It's going to be a silver medal for Italy here. Daniel Loss waves to the crowd. I'm not surprised. He takes that in. Breathe it in. Home turf in Italy. Daniel Loss, second place. And it's going to be a silver medal for the tall man who comes in and across the line. His bond not too far away in Trento. That's our first two riders in and done. But remember, we have a big pack behind. You can see the hugs here. And uh, what a result there for Gianni Vermeesh of Belgium. And uh, we know the Belgian uh, squad's always so strong for things like uh, cyclocross today. It came down to this. Now here comes the uh, sprint. This is for the bronze medal. Well, look at this. It's Van Abermark trying to get the better of Van der Poel. The two class riders have come in. It is going to go to Matthew Van der Poel. It's not going to be a champion's jersey this time round. It's going to be the bronze medal for Van der Poel. Fourth place for Greg Van Abermart as they come in and uh, through the line here. What a result uh, for the uh, riders coming in uh, to the uh, finish here. Ah, look at that. There is big congratulations, Greg Van Abermart. Congratulating uh, Vermeesh there. Lysenko absolutely a spent for us. He's almost laid on his bike uh, there. You can see uh, all these uh, riders are really... Uh, having to suck up the oxygen at the end of the race. You can see everybody coming through this finish. You're going to get congested now. There's a whole load of riders in the age group coming through, mixed in with the riders in the men's elite finish here. A really a busy day in the Citadella. So don't forget all of those results so will be checked by the race referees. They are the commissaire team. Gianni Vermeesh makes his way the other way and uh, he's going to be heading his way down in uh, to the uh, media tent. We're going to try and grab some words with him. We're trying to make sure we uh, get him up on that uh, podium. But fantastic uh, to see what a job done here today. Well, the uh, scrum continues in and uh, beyond the line. The riders trying to make the way through at the end of the race to go uh, get to the uh, helpers to the team uh, crew. And uh, all smiles uh, here, and uh, quite rightly so. Uh, Gianni Vermeesh, our winner. A long, long time to be out on that breakaway. And interestingly, we've not seen any interaction between Daniel Oss and uh, Gianni Vermeesh uh, on our screens uh, yet. Uh, I saw uh, Greg Van Albemarck going up to uh, congratulate uh, uh, our race winner. And uh, here's a rerun of him coming in to the finish. The professional look over the shoulder, the arms up in the air. And what a win by 
uh, Vermish. He comes in uh, to that uh, finish coming from Rosler in uh, Belgium. And uh, I think uh, this is going to be a win he remembers for a, a long time. One of the hard men of the uh, peloton, a rider who spends a lot of his time on domestic duties and occasionally gets a chance to shine individually, but a rider who has shone today. And uh, what a result. He doesn't even look out of breath. That's really depressing. <laughs> he just looks, it must just be the Irish, but he's looking absolutely cool as a cucumber. He's just won a world championship. It's super cool at the finish. Well, inside the uh, Citadel Wars, the uh, party will start for the riders who've taken their titles here today. Outside the walls, our riders are still converging in on a town, completing the last on the outside as our top 10 are confirmed. Gianni Vermeesh taking victory from Daniel Oss by 43 seconds. Matthew van der Polk coming through in third place, one minute 29 down. The same time as Greg Van Albemart, uh, but uh, beating him in the sprint. Fifth place going to Eugenie uh, Ferederoff, uh, 139 down, who took the sprint from McCourt Nielsen. Then it was DeMarkey, Stebart, Valeridi and uh, Nielsen in uh, seventh, eighth, ninth and tenth places here today. And a uh, real interesting mix of riders there. But it shows you with five hours of racing on the uh, clock, the pros who could handle their bike off road as well as on were the ones who shone here today so our riders will continue through for the rest of the afternoon here today a real mix of age groups and one of the great things about gravel if you've been inspired to come out and ride make sure you get a ride in go find your local event your local race it doesn't matter whether that is uh, going to be something like barry Roubaix. bay in Michigan, whether it's going to be uh, Gears and Beers in Australia, the Dirty Raver up in Scotland, whether it's uh, going to be Bedrock Gravel Festival over in Cyprus, grab your local rest, go out and go give it a go because you don't know. You could be here riding for your country, riding in the, the UCI World Championships. You could be out making friends, enjoying the riding, chatting over a drink afterwards about what worked and what didn't, how that you put that race and what happened to you on the way through. Where did your legs go pop? What were those low points and what were the high points? Well, that high point for our race winner, that run into the finish. So Gianni of Vermeesh uh, doing the business. A rider who I've had the pleasure of watching a race uh, for a long time now. And uh, I have to say a rider who I think uh, really uh, showed that this race suited all of his skills, the ability to work out, the ability to put it on the line when it mattered. He took victory. Daniel Loss came in second place. This is the sprint for third place. Van Albemarck conceding that sprint to Van der Poel, one of the hot riders and one of the big favourites. And uh, look at that, Matthew Van der Poel. He lives right on the border, congratulating uh, Vermeer. They've ridden against each other uh, on the cross regularly uh, when they were younger and uh, great to see that uh, between the riders. As so we take a look out across the uh, Citadel here at the World Championships. So some amazing uh, racing over two days here in uh, Veneto in uh, northeastern Italy on the flat plains in uh, between uh, the uh, mountains, between uh, the uh, central uh, region of the Alps, uh, below uh, the uh, Dolomites, on the edge of the hills before you head in towards uh, Venice and the coast. You can see our top 10 here today at the 2022 Gravel World Championships. Our riders coming in behind her. You can see there Schromberg, Havik, Nason, Sagan, Treo, Haas, Beers, Morton, Kavistik, and Fernandez. 11th to 20th place. Sagan, a top 15 place. Great to see Nathan Haas, regular gravel rider, right up there. Lachlan Morton doing the same well in the mix inside the top 20 on a, an incredibly uh, tough day out in uh, Veneto. So our crowds await, our podiums, our riders continue through. I'm sure lots of people waiting for friends and family who are out and racing. And please, guys, make sure whatever bike you ride, whether you're riding your mountain bike, whether you're riding your gravel bike, your road bike, your track bike, whether you're riding a unicycle, 
get out there and ride. If like me, you can't beat going out on the tandem. I always love going out on the tandem. Go out and ride. You can ride gravel events on a tandem. It can be done. Not only can it be done, they can be right up there as well. So whatever you do, however you ride, guys, get out there and run. And if there's one thing to take away from gravel riding, wherever you are in the world, whatever the terrain, you can go out and get a bike that suits it. We saw a real mix of gravel bikes, of gravel tyres, of road tyres, of heavy-duty tyres designed for Paris-Roubaix. We saw our riders on all sorts of machinery taking it to the course here. And it was in a deal. One of those riders who is used to riding on the road and putting the power down for that length of time, who was able to keep that speed and eventually break clear for the solo win. I think realistically of his career, it's a gravel championship. The very first, the inaugural gravel championships here in Veneto for the UCI. Second place for Daniel Oss, not to be his day in the white jersey with those rainbow stripes, but it's gonna be a podium for the Italian rider here today and another rider who richly deserves that, a rider who we've seen do so much work in everything from Grand Tours to one day racing, a rider who has uh, definitely enjoyed the uh, day. He's going to uh, look back and I hope at some point uh, actually think that was a great result rather than wondering what could have been. Matthew van der Poel and Greg van Albemarle immediately behind van der Poel rounding out the podium for the uh, Netherlands with the uh, Belgium rider behind and van der Poel with the winner, Vermeesh. So our rod is being prepped and ready for interviews and prize ceremonies. And we can hear from our winner. General Mitch, congratulations. Uh, you really took the race from the front and, uh, and, and won it uh, with, 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 uh, with that tactical consideration just going out to, to, to set up to win. Yeah, I knew in the final, uh, the single track uh, was one of my favorite parts of the race and uh, I just uh, went full into it and I heard uh, meter for meter I gained uh, some advantage to uh, Daniel and uh, I just went full from there. Quite well, a lot of the time you were exchanging words with Daniel, talking, communicating. Did you have any information? Did you know about the race situation? Yeah, I know about the race situation, but they always, there was one guy coming uh, for the time gap, and it was always in Italian. So every time I asked <laughs> Daniel uh, what was the uh, advantage, yeah, so uh, yeah, we, uh, we just went to the whole day. And, uh, the moment uh, we had uh, five minutes, I knew we just had a good chance to get to the and uh, uh, we just kept going. And then uh, just a uh, man to man fight uh, in the last lap. And you opted not to wait for the sprint where you, I think you would have been the favourite to win, but you went with uh, 6k to go. Yeah, I was hesitating, hesitating a little bit because I knew that the uh, final 500 meter was perfect for me. But uh, yeah, I knew, uh, I felt from uh, them also because there, there was a group coming behind me, heard that they had time for only like 2 minutes 30, so I just want to go full. Also on that start to get for the advantage, and then he was gone. And if I make sure, it can be. It sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's great. Well, crazy, but amazing to see. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Matt Randall down there. The other Matt down there. Uh, Matt Payne here on uh, the microphone. I've been covering all of the action today. It's been an absolute pleasure watching the racing here in Italy. So it's an absolutely amazing place to come and ride your bike. A great place to come and race as well. And just as importantly, a great place to hold a world championship. You can see your top 10 on the screen with uh, Nielsen in 10th Ballerini in 9th Stibar in 8th place there. In those lower places, but still ahead of riders like Peter Sagan, Nathan Haas, like Morgan, Matt Beers in there from South Africa as well, well Clement Fernandez in the mix. And interesting to see the volume of riders who regularly train, not just on the road, but off-road as well. Lillian Kamajan, rider who had issues out in that field, uh, clearly not in the mix at the end. It's like uh, Felix uh, James uh, Mio and the uh, mix as well. So uh, great to see our riders from across the globe coming down into Italy to a race today.
So the uh, crowds wait like we do for our podium presentations of our riders. If you come down to uh, join us uh, down at the side of the barriers that are right, thank you very much. If you have been uh, watching at home, uh, thank you so much for coming and joining us. We will aim to bring you that podium presentation as well as many interviews as we can squeeze out of the riders after having raced for so long. And uh, it's got to be said, today has been an absolute crack out so many riders hundreds and hundreds of riders out on course over the course of the weekend through the duration of the weekend here at the championships and amazing to see how many of our riders uh, coming in to the uh, finish and uh, coming through to experience that same thing that the uh, pros the world elite uh, have had here today the elite men's race today the elite women's yesterday Congratulations. Uh, you really took the race from the front and uh, and and won it uh, with with uh, without tactical considerations just going out to, to to set out to win it yeah i knew in the final uh, the single track uh, was one of my favorite parts of the race and uh, i just uh, went full into it and i heard uh, meter per meter i gained uh, some advantage to uh, to Daniel and uh, I just went full from there to the finish. Quite a lot of the time you were exchanging words with Daniel, talking, communicating. Did you have any information? Did you know about the race situation? Yeah, I know about the race situation, but they always there was one guy coming uh, for the time gap and it was always in Italian. So every time I asked to Daniel uh, what was the, the adventure. So, but yeah, we, uh, we just went full the whole day and uh, the moment uh, we had uh, five minutes, I knew it, we had a big chance to get it, to make it to the finish. And, uh, we just kept going and then it was just a man-to-man -man fight uh, in the last lap. And you opted not to wait for the sprint where you, I think you would have been the favourite to win, but you went with the 6k to go. Yeah, I was hesitating, hesitating a little bit because I knew the, 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 uh, the final 500 meter was perfect for me. But uh, yeah, I knew, I felt on, uh, yeah, also because the, there was a group coming behind, we heard that the advantage was only like 2 minutes 30, so I just... On, I just wanted to go full also on that part to to get yeah for the advantage and then he was dropped so I kept going. Jennifer Mears world champion sounds pretty good. Yeah it's crazy yeah I think uh, it was on one of the biggest chances for me to once become world champion and uh, I cannot believe I gonna have uh, the white rainbow jersey uh, to have it in my house. Absolutely wonderful well done Jenny. Well, great to uh, hear that interview in full. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Matt Rendell down there on uh, the mind, just uh, putting uh, the questions down uh, to Gianni for me. Brilliant to see the answers there and hear those answers. And uh, that, I think, uh, really said it all. You could have just pushed and pushed and pushed. Communication key, listening to what was being said. And uh, the fact that it was in Italian and he had to act as Daniel lost for the translation, really not lost. The by the scruff of the neck uh, and went out there early, built up a big lead. And maybe you just had the wrong guy out there with you to win. But listen, we are here really to discover, I think, a new world, a new way of biking, the bi riding a bike, because nobody knows at the start line what's going to happen. And we discover it kilometers by kilometers. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rule is attack, because when you don't know what you can do, just attack and then well, look what's, what's going on. I was in shape because it's the last period of the season. Uh, and I stop in July and then I work out for the last races. And then I have to say thanks to Jean-René, the team, let me do this amazing world championship, new gravel. And I have to say thank you to Specialize, give me the, such an amazing bike. And Castellian Sportful always support me with the technical, uh, you know, clothing. clothing and stuff, yeah. And uh, looks like you're quite good at this. Looks like, yeah. <laughs> but it, I, I repeat it, it's new. So I, I had a really nice uh, company <laughs> during this long, long, long breakaway. I think it's the longest ever in my life. And he was he was stronger, just just this. So he deserved it. He went out in the technical part, and the last 10k really <laughs> bumpy, and it was like crampy, and my head was a bit in the foggy. <laughs> but I'm really happy, and really the day is 
Uh, the, the message, really, the new word of riding a bike. Well, I can definitely echo those comments of uh, Daniel Oss. And it is great to see that he really appreciates that. Sometimes not knowing what's in front of you is better because that is uh, going to uh, be an easier way to ride. And uh, I love the fact it's just a, attack is the way forward. You've just got to attack. If you don't know what's happening, you go out. You go attack because why wouldn't you do that? That is exactly what you are loving about the riding. I think that's what I've loved about the racing. It's been out and at it. And if we just convert a few of these riders into riding loads more gravel events, then you know what? It's been a good day out on the roads of Italy. And I think we've got a lot more people thinking, this is for me. I might not uh, be uh, a rider who can be right up there on the road. I might not be the rider who's got the full package and the uh, absolute insane skills of uh, being a full-on technical mountain biker. But do you know what? I am going to be a rider who can do a bit of everything really, really well. And that is for me. And that is uh, what we're seeing here today. Gianni Vermeesh taking victory. In fact, only his second victory uh, this year. A stage win, stage five of the four days of Dunkirk. And a uh, great result for uh, Vermeesh as he came in and through the line. His second victory this year, and by far the uh, biggest of uh, his uh, career, as far as uh, I think I can find out, uh, and as far as I can remember, because uh, Gianni Vermeesh, a, a rifle winner here today. He rode strong, he rode it uh, very, very hard and was able to push all the way into the finish. And once he knew he had that little bit of gap, he said he loved that single track section. He really was able to push on. He could open the gap. Daniel Oss, a rider who has absolutely loved his day out. Please, Daniel, come and ride some of the gravel events in the States. Come out and ride some of the big gravel races because, you know what, this man's clearly got a talent for them. And I think there's a lot more to come from the big guy as well. And uh, I think... Uh, his love of riding the bike, it shone through today. Great to see Daniel Oss take away second place in the race. Well, one man who we know who loves to race and he loves to win and he loves to ride pretty much anything and any bike, anywhere, anytime, it is Matthew Vanderpol who took away third place in that sprint from Greg Van Arbermart and uh, got the congratulations of Gianni Vermeesh, a long time uh, racer and uh, competitor who uh, the two have uh, fought uh, against uh, time and time again. We will be uh, showing you that podium ceremony very shortly here, but uh, as we await, we look down on the amazing walls. The work done to restore this uh, medieval citadella continues onwards. They've still got lots uh, of things planned and in the pipeline. And if you've been inspired by the scenery, make sure you go down. But if you do go visit, stick a bike in. Make sure you take it with you and get out and ride. If you don't want to take one, you can hire one. It's Italy. There's bikes everywhere, believe me. And there's some great riding and racing to be had of all types. Whether you ride a mountain bike, a gravel bike, a road bike, whatever you ride, guys, make sure you take your bike with you and get uh, those uh, kilometers, get those miles in out in some absolutely stunning scenery. Veneto, the home of uh, the 2022 Gravel Challenge. Championships, lots more disciplines still with World Championships on the go, and uh, I think we can just uh, see Johnny Vermeesh making his way across for what will be a very familiar sound, and that is going to uh, be the uh, UCI anthem for the uh, World Championships. Good to see we've got mountain bike uh, straight bars down on uh, the start line in one of our age group riders. Remember, whatever bike you ride, go out and ride gravel. There are events that will suit you and your bike style. So as Gianni, Matthew and Daniel head across to the podium in the uh, Piazza in the square at the side of the, uh, it looks like the auditorium down inside of uh, the Citadella. We are going to uh, be uh, bringing you that podium shortly. In the meantime, a uh, quick reminder. This is uh, the uh, 2022 UCI Gravel World Championships. Today, the men's race, the men's elite race. Yesterday, the women's elite race. If you haven't watched it, make sure you do. Another historic day being made yesterday and a, a great uh, 
bit of action out there from a real variety of riders, from a, a massive variety of uh, backgrounds. So lots more World Championships coming up. We're just starting the Cyclocross season and the World Cups kicking off in Waterlooville over in the States. And uh, we have a, a real uh, uh, variety of uh, locations uh, heading uh, up uh, with uh, Waterloo. And we go all the way around. We're going to be in Bessanson in France. We're going to be in Val d'Isola again. We've got some of the uh, great classics. So don't forget, of course, to the uh, World Championships coming up in Hugerheide. That is uh, going to be at the end of the season. We also, of course, have next week our World Track Championships. And make sure you watch the action from the velodrome, almost the polar opposite of the gravel championships here today. A super smooth wooden boards, indoors. You know exactly what's coming. You know exactly what the air pressure is. You know what the temperature is going to be. And you know what you need to do here. A whole different world. And the unknown being explored by our riders out and around Veneto in Italy. Well, the party's already started down in the Citadel, bringing our riders up through the line and uh, no doubt heading to uh, refuel. Some of our uh, age group riders continue to come uh, through. Some real uh, classic gravel setups down there. Plenty of people uh, with the uh, gang here. And uh, looks uh, like uh, they have uh, the. Uh, the flare bars, the more traditional flare bars for gravel, lots of people with camelbacks on for high hydration, certainly something you won't see at the UCI Track Cycling World uh, Championships. We also have, of course, uh, lots more coming up. We've got Trails Championships coming up. We've got Flatlands and BMX. That's going to be uh, coming out uh, towards the end of uh, November. And, of course, the UCI covering uh, a whole range of different uh, disciplines. I've been lucky enough to put words to the action, to everything from artistic cycling to cycle ball, right the way through across road track, as well as the uh, mountain bike. And a uh, great pleasure to be putting words to the action on the uh, Gravel World Championships here in Veneto. And probably the nearest to my general riding that you would, you would get, I have to say. It's uh, the uh, tracks and trails out uh, here, very similar to the trails, uh, literally quite out of my uh, back door and uh, very uh, similar. Lots more tougher, slightly tougher terrain uh, out in the uh, Peak District for me, so uh, more mountain bike when we head uh, that direction, but uh, also plenty of nice roads to head on. But whatever bike you ride, don't forget, uh, there's a discipline out there that's going to suit you. So if you're explosive, you can uh, do the skills. You uh, have the pace and the sprint power. Maybe you're going to be on the BMX. Uh, some of the uh, BMX series are heading out and around. Some great uh, footage coming over and uh, great to see the action coming from that. We've uh, got lots more racing to come. And of course, lots more riders to see entertain us. We've had an amazing year of cycling so far. And that is only going to continue onwards. So, as we await our podium ceremony, the riders will be prepped and ready. Our top three riders will be on the stage to receive their bronze, silver, and gold medals, and of course, the coveted jersey. Now, the World Championships uh, at the moment due to be back in with us. So, Plenty of uh, locations uh, putting bids in for the forthcoming years of the Gravel Championships. Don't forget, of course, we've got uh, lots of cycling displays up in Glasgow next year. So that ranges from the downhill mountain bike at the infamous Fort William venue through, through the road from the track at the Chris Hoy of Velodrome. Velodrome. We're also going to uh, see the cross-country mountain bike up there as well. Great to see so many displays. We've got lots of others who are heading out and around the uh, globe. Remember, we have Barcelona for the home of the XCE not all that uh, long ago. A uh, uh, discipline which is super short, really a fast action, and a uh, great job with that. We were up in the Himalayas, in fact, uh, with that in Ladakh. We we're across in the Philippines, where we've had a round of the Gravel World Series. And you do need to watch out 
for the dates of the 2023 Gravel World Series coming up. So this year, we were in April, we were in the Philippines, we were in Australia on the 15th of May. That's for the seven Gravel event in France in June, along with uh, Poland and the USA, with uh, the uh, Wish One Gravel Race, the Gravel Adventure and the Highlands Gravel Classic. Went to Sweden and Belgium in August with the uh, Gravel Grit and Grind and the uh, Hoofa Gravel uh, Race in uh, Hoovelays. We have, of course, been in Italy in September, as well as Australia, Netherlands and Spain with uh, our Strada Bianchi, uh, the Monster Ferrata uh, event. We have our Gravel Lista, the Gravel uh, 150, and, of course, Hutchinson uh, Rag. So, uh, Gravel, all precursors to this, the World Gravel Championships. Coming to you from Veneto in Italy. Now, our riders did have to qualify for this. They either had to be selected by their nation or, of course, they had to qualify top 25% in those qualifying World Series races to get down on to the start line. And don't uh, forget, this is what everybody is aiming for, to be on the Gravel World Championship podium. Cerimonia ufficiale di premiazione del Mondiale UCI 2022 Gravel Uomini Elite. Le medaglie e la maglia saranno consegnate da Enrico Della Casa, vicepresidente dell'Unione Ciclistica Internazionale. The medals and the jersey will be presented by Mr. Enrico Della Casa, vice president of UCI. Al terzo posto e vincitore della medaglia di bronzo in third place and winner of the bronze medal Mathieu Van der Poel from the Netherlands So Matthew Van der Poel on the podium once again at a race he was uh, off fancy to at sake and the question will be will he come back? I'm sure he will In uh, second Vincitore della medaglia d'argento in a second place and winner of a silver medal coming from Italy, arriva dall'Italia, Daniel Ossa! The silver medal are going uh, to uh, Daniel Ossa. Daniel going to be uh, taking that away. A very happy man at the end of that race. He steps up on to the podium. So Gianni Vermeesh is your 2022 Gravel World Champion. He pulls on that iconic white jersey with the rainbow bands on. And I'm not sure who's happiest, Gianni or Matthew, stood next to him, who he has raced against uh, for decades out on the uh, courses. The golden medal also presented by the vice president of the UCI. And uh, this, the very first men's elite title. The world champion, the man taking that race win in five hours, 10 minutes, 40 seconds, Gianni Vermeesh. So we have our local representatives from here in Veneto in Italy and of course our president of the Italian Cycling Federation going to be presenting our rose. Fantastic to have them up here and uh, present and of course thank you so much to everybody who's made these championships happen here today. Ladies and gentlemen, may we have your attention now for the national anthem of Belgium.
So three uh, worthy medal winners here at the UCI 2022 uh, Gravel World Championships. The bronze medal going to Matthew van der Poel, the silver medal to Daniel Oss, and the gold medal and that world champions uh, jersey and title being taken by Gianni Vermish. Amazing racing, great riding, and three very worthy medalists who will now take up their media duties, no doubt. There's going to be plenty of jerseys to be signed by Gianni Vermish, as well as lots of pictures, no doubt, of him biting that gold medal as well. And I think... Uh, it was great to see on the podium, on the stage, just how happy for Jerry for me, Matthew van der Poel was there. But all of the riders, I think, enjoyed their day out here today in Veneta. I hope you've really enjoyed the action. And don't forget, there is lots more racing still to come on, lots of different types of bike. Meanwhile, here in Veneto, our riders will continue to make their way in over the line in all of our various age groups, our professional and amateurs racing on the same course at the same time. And great to see so many people taking part in this, the inaugural UCI World Gravel Championships. So two great days of racing, two amazing uh, champions crowned, uh, two uh, fantastic race of finishes here at the uh, Citadella. A massive uh, thank you to our riders. And I think we can catch up with Matthew van der Poel, who's down with Matt Rendell now. <laughs> Matthew van der Poel, a bronze medal, not the gold, but uh, still nice to be on the podium. How's your day been? Yeah, I think the highest half bar. It was tactically a yeah, difficult race. I think, uh, yeah, Chani and Os were away, and it was very quickly clear that they were going to win. I think I had the highest half bar there out with the third place. Happy with your day? Um, I had certainly not the feeling that I could win, but. Ik werd ook niet slechter op het einde, dus ik kon wel blijven rijden. En ik denk dat ik, dat ik op het einde gewoon een goede beslissing heb genomen en dat ik daarom ook derde kon worden. Did that make sense? Yes. Thank you very much. Did you say we Yeah, exactly. So, uh, can I ask you in English and you answer in Flemish? Okay, is that okay? Yeah, in English with the Roma jersey, then in Flemish. Thank you. Okay, More of okay. our interviews going out in uh, Flemish, as remember, of course, this will be heading back in uh, to the uh, Low Countries. How does it feel? It feels really good. It's, uh, yeah, it's a childhood dream. So uh, now uh, yeah, I have my jersey. It's really nice. And uh, we know you as a cyclocross rider, as a road rider, you're a gravel rider now. A bit more of this in the future? Yeah, I hope so. It's the first one. I'm really happy to be the first world champion in gravel, but uh, I, I really think uh, it's going to be something for, uh, for, the, for the future. Now we'll do the same, but you speak yeah. Flemish, OK? <laughs> Jenny, wonderful. You're wearing that rainbow jersey. How does it feel? Ja, het voelt ongelooflijk. Het is, het is een droom van Ken zelf om toch ooit een wereldboektrui aan te hebben. En vandaag heb ik die. Dus het is ook de eerste in, in de gravel. Dus het is iets uniek. And you're a cyclocross rider, you're a road rider. We know all about that. But now you're a gravel world champion too. A bit more gravel racing in the future? Ja, ik denk het wel. Het is, het is iets van de toekomst. Het materiaal ontwikkelt zich ook. En, ja, en het was gewoon plezant. Het is iets moois. There was a lot of people here today, so I've had a lot of fun. How good is that? <laughs> well, great to see our riders. They know the score. A bronze medal, not the gold, but uh, still nice to be on the podium. How's your day been? Yeah, I think the highest half bar. It was a tactically uh, difficult yeah, race. I think, uh, yeah, Chani and Os were away. It was very quickly clear that they were going to win. I think I had the highest half bar there out with the third place. Happy with your day? Um, I had certainly not the feeling that I could win, but I was not too bad at the end, so I could still drive. I think that I had a good decision at the end and that I could also be third. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. So our riders continue with their interviews. They have got some serious duties to do. You can see our top three riders are there with uh, Matthew Vanderpool, 
Daniel Loss and Gianni Vermish with the bronze, silver and gold medals. Great action, great racing, and uh, good to see Gianni Vermish. I think a reward for uh, a long time out and uh, racing very, very hard indeed. Uh, good to uh, see that uh, these riders, they you know. Uh, Exactly what's in front of them, plenty of media duties, plenty of press duties, and then they'll be heading off. Uh, some of the riders now at the end of their race season, some riders are going to be uh, having a break, some riders going straight into the cyclocross season and into the uh, race. And a number of riders are heading uh, across to the uh, track and uh, going to be heading into a track season over the winter. But whatever you are going to be up to, make sure you get out and ride the bike. So like our riders will be doing, they'll be uh, getting plenty of miles, plenty of kilometres. They'll get, of course, all of the action uh, today and uh, yesterday, all because we're able to come and visit this amazing uh, town here to finish in the citadel after starting in vicenza an amazing setting for the very first uci gravel world championships So as we leave our crowds to disperse and head off home, thank you very much for watching. My name is Matt Penny. It's been a pleasure putting words to the action. Stay safe. Enjoy your bike riding. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.